All right, hello everybody. This is uh, A.W. with uh, Hyperion, Joshua, and uh, Chaya. Uh, continuing the German ideology, chapter one. Uh, last time we left off at uh, History and Fundamental Conditions, which is about uh, close to two-thirds of the way through. Last time, uh, there wasn't really that much that uh, there was to talk about, really. I mean, a lot of what I... What was objectionable was just kind of obviously objectionable, and uh, really there isn't much to say about uh, that. Other than, you know, Marx kind of jumped the gun on certain things, which uh, history has proven him wrong on. Um, and, you know, not so much as, like, the logical mistakes, uh, which uh, weren't too bad. I mean, he does say a lot of things which uh, are easily misconstruable as... Uh, highly reductive, deterministic. But they can also be, once put into the context of uh, the 1844 manuscripts and the later stuff on Marx, that clearly Marx couldn't have been really thinking in deterministic, reductive terms. Nonetheless, he wrote it in that way. So uh, we'll continue on. Uh, history, fundamental conditions. Since we are dealing with the Germans, who are devoid of premises, we must begin by stating the first premise of all human existence and, therefore, of all history. The premise, namely, that men must be in a position to live in order to be able to make history. But life involves, before everything else, eating and drinking, a habitation, clothing, and many other things. The first historical act is thus the production of the means to satisfy these needs, the production of material life itself. And, indeed, this is... An historical act, a fundamental condition of all history, which today, as thousands of years ago, must daily and hourly be fulfilled merely in order to sustain human life. Even when the sensuous world is reduced to a minimum, to a stick, as was St. Bruno Bauer, it presupposes the action of producing the stick. Therefore, in any interpretation of history, one has first of all to observe this fundamental fact in all its significance and all its implications, and to accord it its due importance. It is well known that the Germans have never done this, and they have never, therefore, had an early, an earthly basis for history, and consequently never an historian. The French and the English, even if they have conceived the relation of this fact with so-called history, only in an extremely one-sided fashion, particularly as long as they remained in the toils of political ideology, have nevertheless made the first attempts to give the writing of history a materialistic basis by being the first to write histories of civil society of commerce and industry. So, I mean, the point about, uh, obviously, we always have to produce our livelihood, kind of obvious. I don't think many people missed that, uh, so much as they kind of just thought it, eh, unimportant, right? The first historical act is thus the production of the means to satisfy these needs, the production of material life itself. Um, I suppose one could say that at the same time. There's just kind of some questions about... This kind of assumes us, uh, is assuming a sort of like beginning point of, you know, humanity one day was a social being, whereas, you know, before that was like something like a uh, caveman or something. So really, I mean, historically speaking, there doesn't seem to really be any case for a so-called first historical act so much as uh, things just kind of went along and eventually uh, consciousness arose mm -hmm. uh, in the modern sense, you know, self-reflective beings. And by that point, I mean, we'd already been living for a long time, so it seems kind of a, a, a duality of sorts. So therefore, in any interpretation of history, one has, first of all, to observe this fundamental fact in all its significance, in all its implications, and to accord it its due importance. Mm, yeah. I kind of have agreements with that, and I also kind of have disagreements. So, you know, 
I think it is something important to take into account, I, but I also don't think it's the important thing to take into account, really. As far as I see it, I kind of go uh, really kind of midway between him and Hegel, in which I don't really think there is a fundamental thing that needs to be taken into account so much as there are fundamental things. You know, so the way of life, mode of production, culture, all those things must be taken into account. But uh, there, is a, there isn't fundamentally, logically, one that precedes the other so much as uh, they're kind of there together. All right, continuing. The second point is that the satisfaction of the first need, the action of satisfying, and the instrument of satisfaction, which has been acquired, leads to new needs. And this production of new needs is the first historical act. Here we recognize immediately the spiritual ancestry of the great historical wisdom of the Germans who, when they run out of positive material, and when they can serve up neither theological nor political nor literary rubbish, assert that this is not history at all, but the prehistoric era. They do not, however, enlighten us as to how we proceed from this nonsensical prehistory to history proper. Although on the other on the other, eh, although on the other hand, in their historical speculation, they seize upon this prehistory with a special eagerness because they imagine themselves safe there from interference on the part of crude facts, and at the same time, because there they can give full rein to their speculative impulse and set up and knock down hypotheses by the thousand. And um, here he's kind of ragging on people like uh, Hegel, I suppose. Um, I don't know, but I... I I mean, obviously the German ideologist, but uh, Hegel probably falls in that somewhere. In that the mere fact of, you know, having a species life of, you know, you go out and eat, you do certain things to stay alive, you reproduce a species, is not of historical importance to people like Hegel. Mm -hmm. And in that, frankly, I agree. Uh, I mean, what is the historical importance of the fact that we eat, make house, you know, may find shelter, have sex, rear uh, children, and, you know, keep the species ongoing. Uh, that's not really of a historical importance until you get to the point in which there is a sudden uh, build-up of consciousness yeah. in yeah, which yeah. suddenly we have learning. Suddenly we don't just make the same shit over and over again. Uh, we start accumulating a knowledge, rethinking things, uh, crafting more intricate things, and that just goes along not only with the crafting of material things, but the crafting of ideas. So, you know, the buildup of material ideas, the material understanding, as well as conceptual ideal understanding, uh, it comes, you know, I don't know if the word is right, uh, tandem, you know, they come together, they tie, they're tied yeah. together. And you can't unlink one from the other, you know, you can't just talk, well, the first we made stuff, you know, and then we just made more intricate stuff, and then we made more intricate ideas. No, the very making of intricate things is intricate ideas already. At least in for us, you know, there are animals that make intricate things but don't have any idea of them. You know, they just feel them, so mm -hmm. to say. Like a beaver making a dam, uh, what, there's like dam or whatever. Yeah, or spiders. <laughs> yeah, spider web. Yeah. yeah, very intricate uh, structures. Nonetheless, uh, they don't really have an idea in their head. You know, they just seem to have a feeling for it but then again we you know we have no right to say they have no idea in their head but uh, it seems hard we to don't believe know that they their do. perspective yeah <laughs> it's uh it's very likely much much more likely that they, they don't yeah even if it were like that they were creating uh, more intricate patterns or whatever it's still really not of historical import because they haven't moved beyond the web you know yeah yeah you know it's just a it's a programmed concept and an innate concept, but the, they don't really conceive new concepts ever. And that's what history is about, actually. History is the build-up, uh, which is why, in a way, nature does not have a history in that uh, all of the realms of nature are just kind of already given there, uh, logically, at the beginning. You know, you, ha you don't really have a history of, uh, of nature learning from itself so much as it just kind of happened. 
you know, you, one can speak of a record of events, you know, in which once first this happened and that happened, but that's not history itself, uh, at least not in any meaningful sense uh, that we could really ultimately care about. Because, um, I mean, really think about it. We don't really care about what happened if it doesn't actually connect to us. You know, which is why I think most people, including myself, uh, don't really care about history for the most part, insofar as there, you don't see any connection of that history to you. Uh, even in the sense of, well, you know, that's how we got here. Well, I don't really care, you know, what the Greeks were up to. That if even though, you know, chronologically that's part of the steps of how we got there, uh, it just kind of seems, you know, disconnected, uh, which is why for up until my second uh, history class in college, I just didn't care about history. Like, history was just boring to me. And then I had a, pr a professor who actually connected that history right to the modern day, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, history matters. You know, I could see an actual connection. That history was my history. That history explained my current present. That's when history is history, you know? Other than that, nobody cares. So, you know, the life we had of just creating random material stuff before society, well, nobody cares. Uh, it's only history once we have society and we have the buildup of consciousness, the buildup of science, the buildup of knowledge, and therefore the buildup of activities. But sure, I mean, I'm not going to die with what Mark says here, in which obviously that's got to be there first. Uh, I don't think, like I said, I don't, I don't think many people missed out on that fact. Aristotle didn't miss yeah. it, and certainly um, Plato didn't miss it either. It's kind of an obvious fact, but, you know, it's not an immediately obvious, important one, you know. Continuing, the, the third circumstance which, from the very outset, enters into historical development is that men who daily remake their own life begin to make other men to propagate their kind. The relation between man and woman, parents and children, the family, the family which, to begin with, is the only social relationship, becomes later when increased, de increased needs create new social relations and the increased population new needs, a subordinate one except in Germany and must then be treated and analyzed according to the existing empirical data, not according to the concept of the family, as is the custom in Germany. These three aspects of social activity are not, of course, to be taken as three different stages, but just as three aspects, or to make it clear to the Germans, three moments, which have existed simultaneously since the dawn of history and the first men, and which still assert themselves in history today. Well, these, these three first circumstances, quite frankly, feel to me to be utterly banal. I mean, as to just be like, <laughs> why? why? Why does it matter, Marx? Like, I just don't see a point. Who, who didn't acknowledge this? I, I'd be amazed if there was anyone who really did not acknowledge that, you know, first we had to fucking live, <laughs> we had to eat and have housing and reproduce. And, you know, that obviously, you know, we give birth to children and we have this thing called the family which historically, you know, changes in, in meaning and context. Uh, although when he's talking about the concept of the family, I mean, he's probably the only one who really seems to speak in, that I know of that speaks in that kind of idea, that kind of way is obviously Hegel, in which Hegel talks about the concept of the family and the philosophy of right. And uh, Hegel is not at all interested in the historical family. Uh, He's interested in exactly what he says, the concept of the family, which is not the family that exists or has existed so much as the family as what is the rational aspect of the family when we look in history and like talk about the family. Because, you know, uh, this is one of the things in which I think Marx never quite, at least here he hadn't quite understood it, if he ever understands it, that... Uh, uh, the, the philosophical notion of these things is not the historical notion of these things. It's a rational version of what we could kind of see in the historical notion. But the historical notion is not what 
one is trying to get at. You know, one is trying to get at what what uh, it's kind of like it's a problematic concept in that uh, it's mixed with various historical contingencies. You know, they're just kind of given customs. The family in one society is not the same as the family in another. In one society, some people are your family, some people are not. Uh, some duties are had to the family in some societies, some other duties are not. And, you know, what are we to say about that? Uh, you know, uh, other than that, well, you know, uh, the concept of the family seems to be arbitrary, except for the fact that, you know, there seems to be a sort of, like, blood relation that seems kind of customary. And even then, it's mm-hmm. not really universal. Yeah. Because friends are the family you choose. Uh, yeah, and then there's also just the... Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there are some societies in which the concept of family as such doesn't really come into it that much such that you know you have uh, these very communal societies in which you know uh, the mother and father don't really quite exist uh, as you know this given individual relationship and you know the community just raises the entire children the children don't have everybody's everybody's like uh, you know son daughter everybody's everybody's like mom dad uh, there really isn't a special specific relation given to that blood relation yeah. at all I wouldn't be surprised if I don't know if anybody if those have existed but I wouldn't be surprised if they well, did you know Plato suggested that but I don't think I don't know if it has been put into practice before. I mean Marx suggests it too by the way I mean that's kind of yeah. like the absence of the family he's after you know in that there there should be no privileging of this relationship. Mm-hmm. Although, um, frankly, I disagree, uh, I disagree. But we see where he's coming from in the ideal society. Or whatever, you know. Yeah, not that it does, how not that it couldn't ideal, work. By the way, yeah, it could I definitely mean, work. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't doubt it. I mean, could work at all. <laughs> I just wouldn't like ideal it. <laughs> to see the other as as like you or someone that's not opposed to you some some conception of the fa- of a global family or whatever but i just don't think that i think there are special privileges given to family members like of your immediate family or people that are very close to you that you wouldn't extend to uh just a complete stranger quote unquote because not everyone can know everyone else obviously on the earth with uh, what seven billion people but yeah, yeah treating others as you uh... would I mean, no old mom would ever be able to love me like a real mother. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know about the real mother thing. Like, uh, I think there is a special bond between not not just biologically. I mean, obviously, there's a biologically there's like that. So we know about the whole hormonal thing. No, I didn't mean like a bio. I didn't mean a biological thing, but I mean like you know a real mother that's my mother not just yeah. a communal mother even if you were yeah. adopted you mean yeah that uh, i think yeah, that is a unique relationship adopted. that certainly is a unique yeah. relationship and i think Especially it's an important one yeah. when you read freud uh, becomes a unique <laughs> relationship yeah but also uh it's not always the case that someone's mother's uh, very loving or whatever you know. So there are exceptions, but... Or that, uh, you know, most people (laughs) particularly feel or acknowledge that need, you know. Even though we have that need, not all of us ever come to light uh, of understanding what that need actually is. Yeah. I mean, I know a few people who just uh, seem to just not care. They're screwed up, but they don't, uh, you know, do they think of themselves like, oh, I'm this way because my mom never loved me. And like, are they really desperate for that love? They probably don't feel it, even though... Maybe they they do need it, but uh, that's a whole other ball of issues of you know consciousness, unconsciousness, and blah blah blah. But yeah, um, let's continue. The production, the production of life, both of one's own in labor and of fresh life in procreation, now appears as a double relationship. On the one hand, as a natural; on the other, as a social relationship. By social, we understand the cooperation of several individuals, no matter under what conditions. 
in what manner and to what end. It follows from this that, certain mo that a certain mode of production or industrial stage is always combined with a certain mode of cooperation or social stage, and this mode of cooperation is itself a productive force. Further, that the multitude of productive forces accessible to men determines the nature of society, hence that the history of humanity must always be studied and treated in relation to the history of industry and exchange. But it is also clear how in Germany it is impossible to write this sort of history, because the Germans lack not only the necessary power of comprehension and the material, but also the evidence of their senses. For across the Rhine, you cannot have any experience of these things since history has stopped happening. Thus, it is quite obvious from the start that there exists a materialistic connection of men with one another, which is determined by their needs and their mode of production, and which is as old as men themselves. This connection is ever taking on new forms, and thus presents a history, independently of the existence of any political or religious nonsense, which in addition may hold men together. Be right back. So, um... Well, so uh, there I seems to be a, a bit of a jump here. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'd just like to say he's at least not completely reductionist because he does say, you know, the political and religious nonsense holds men together in some ways as well. Yeah, um, let's see. The production of life, both of one's own in labor and of fresh life and procreation, now appears as a double relationship. On the one hand, as a natural, on the other hand, as a social relationship. Yeah, okay, that's not so much of a jump, obviously. The pro obviously, reproduction is a social thing. You need two people uh, in relation to each other. And obviously, we raise uh, our young socially. Yeah, we're not like uh, cheetahs or something, where we screw and then like uh, you know we split both ways. Cheetahs. Mm -hmm. Although I mean, like that's uh, it, technically it's right, but it seems to be a stretch on the considering it's a social relationship of sorts. I mean, there are plenty of animals that come together, mate, and then you fuck off. So while well, reproduction yeah. is. Uh, a social thing, uh, cr you know, uh, raising is not. Cooperation. Common moving together. By social, we understand the cooperation of several individuals, no matter under what conditions, in what manner, and to what ends. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, is reproduction really a cooperation? Um, well, it seems to me that much of it was just kind of like it happened and uh, was also forced for the most part. <laughs> no, what type of? Wait, did you say production or procreation? Reproduction, like procreation. Oh, reproduction. Okay, yeah, reproduction maybe. Reproduction. Like, like sexual reproduction. Yeah, it's a cooperation. It requires both. It's well, you could form. you could say <laughs> that uh, sexuality. Sorry, dogs are going crazy. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, it is definitely a kind of reproduction for society. You need to create more humans to live in this society. Yeah. And then they carry on the society. 
Let me leave. All right, sorry about that. That's cool. The dogs are literally stupid. <laughs> kind of like the Germans, if we are to believe Marx here. It's weird how, like, Germans are so self-hating. Like, even before all the Nazi the nonsense. Being critical, man. It's what makes them so good. They're, they self-critique all the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's very unlike, well, I don't know. A lot of Americans, of course, are very self-critical. But yeah, but uh, a Americans lot of the same way they act. Yeah. The thing is that like Americans, of, uh, Americans can be self-critical, but they don't really make much of an effort to improve. That's yeah, what I've found. Yeah, it's more self-deprecation. Self-flagellation, yeah. rather. And also yeah. some sort of, like, they can't take critique very well at all from outside. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, you know, with the whole take a knee thing. People, yeah. like, you know, not standing up for their silly song, they get very upset. Because <laughs> they feel it's a personal slide against them. And therefore, bad. Yeah, I don't know, let's continue that. Uh... And by social, we understand the cooperation of several individuals, no matter under what conditions, in what manner, and to what end. It follows from this that a certain mode of production or industrial stage is always combined with a certain mode of cooperation or social stage, and this mode of cooperation is itself a productive force. Yeah, okay, so that elucidates something I had not heard of before, uh, since I'd never read this. Uh, I mean, this is kind of like the whole, like, uh, ideas are productive forces themselves, you know, because uh, the very form of cooperation, you know, the social relations of production uh, are instantiations of social ideas, which are productive forces. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, we can definitely see that uh, in the modern day, especially, I mean, uh, shit, pro propaganda, not propaganda, but... Uh, Marketing. Marketing is basically the attempt to generate <laughs> productive forces out of ideas. You know, uh, suddenly people want something, the idea demand becomes a productive force in that it, it creates its own necessities. Uh, further, that the multitude of productive forces accessible to men determines the nature of society hence that the history of humanity must always be studied and treated in relation to the history of industry and exchange obviously there is a depending on how one understands that that's either reductive or it's just kind of okay it's a good point kind of obvious to us today but uh, you know the multitude of productive forces accessible in accessible to men determines the nature of society, hence that the history of humanity must always be studied and treated in the relation to the history of industry exchange. So if determines here is taken as the determiner, you know, the privileged determiner, uh, which determines the rest, uh, then it is reductive and it's false, uh, in my opinion. Although I, I find, uh, I wish I didn't have to say my opinion, because uh, I want to say that's just a fact, but uh, I'm willing to give some little ground to the possibility that maybe, just maybe, I'm just wrong, and I'm the product of uh, just technology playing itself out. Maybe this is the Matrix. Ooh. But um, otherwise, obviously, you know, the, the ways we produce, the things we produce, uh, uh, are determinative of the nature of society. They're just not the determinant uh, or the ultimate determiner or the favorite phrase of Marxist. In the final 
in the final analysis, you know, it was all economics. No, not really. Uh, but it is also clear how in Germany it is impossible to write this sort of history because the Germans lack not only the necessary power of comprehension, so the Germans are apparently too stupid, but they also just don't have the things to analyze, even if they had the power of comprehension. So, I mean, this is talking about the backwardness of, of Germany at the time, in which uh, Germany was not yet as economically advanced or bourgeois as uh, Britain was. Uh, thus, it is quite obvious from the start that there exists a materialistic connection of men with one another, which is determined by their needs and their mode of production, and which is as old as men themselves. Um, sure, you know, men have to live and must, you know, if they are within society and they cooperate in society, obviously they must produce with each other, they must do those kinds of things. However, here obviously the missing link is you don't have any actual explanation of why the structures are as they are. Uh, you know, the fact that one needs to eat and uh, have sex and have kids and raise kids uh, does not at all tell you as to how you're going to carry that around. That has something to do with, uh, you know, the self-determination of human society in the realm of society as such, which is the realm of the conceptions of ourselves. You know, we relate to each other as we conceive of ourselves and each other. You know, here in Burgerland, we all think that we exist in our abstract little bubbles and uh, don't actually need anybody else, that we could just all, all work very, very hard and that we could all become the next Donald Trump. A uh, multi-billionaire extraordinaire servant of uh, Lord Putin. <laughs> but, uh, you know, obviously that's... Uh, just a self-conception and we live that way even though we don't actually live that way we certainly act as if we lived that way in many ways well yeah, yeah we're temporarily embarrassed billionaires <laughs> yeah and uh, somewhere like Denmark or, whatever, or wherever like uh, social democracy still has uh, some remnants of existence uh, the conception of themselves and others is obviously quite different and therefore, you know, their relation to each other, their actual material relationship is, to that extent, that much different. Yeah. You know, they have uh, actual health care available to everybody. It's a, pro a product of their own conceptions of themselves and what they, you know, their duties to each other, you know, how they relate to each other. Mm -hmm. In Denmark, it's frowned upon if you, like, say, oh, I made so much money this year or something, you know. Can you confirm. Well, can confirm. Yeah, so yeah, um, and, and those things come about uh, ideally. Uh, they're not dictated by you actually working somewhere. You know, people have to come to some sort of social notion and acceptance of a notion of themselves uh, in order for that to happen. So Marx cannot just simply go and say, well, you know, it's just a material connection of men. You know, it eventually determines everything. It doesn't explain the relation of the structure to begin with. Because it's fine to say, well, you know, we got to live and do that. Okay, well, how are you to explain... Uh, you know, all these other different arrangements that people can have. You know, why is it that there isn't a given arrangement f for everybody, apparently? You know, it's not all just, not all primitive communism is, you know, the same. Uh, not all uh, primitive nomadic, my, uh, nomadic tribes are all the same. They don't have the same universal structures, blah, blah, blah. They don't have the same conceptions of religion, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there, are, there seems to be some kind of... Uh, universality across them, but it's a very general, very, very general universality, if there's any at all. Um, although I will say, obviously, there are certain conditions of material existence which are necessary in order for people to conceive of themselves in a certain way and actually attempt to live that certain way you know you can't uh, you can't follow the fall into this whole myth of like the individual if you can't actually ever like get away with living as an individual you know because yeah, well, yeah, otherwise you that, know, your that actual goes existence along with my, that just goes along with my thesis that people 
don't want what they say they want, you know? I mean, I know this is something Zizek says too, but I'm thinking about it in the sense of, you know, the things that they say about, I'm an individualist, I could live as an individualist, I want this sort of system. They would not thrive in that sort of system. They're just thinking about it as ideal, but they don't know, like, how it would actually be. And it wouldn't be good for them. They would complain about it <laughs> if it were to come to fruition. Um, so, yeah, you know, individualism is not possible without a certain, uh, you know, level of development of the productive forces in which, you know, we can all comfortably, like, mm. you cut off. out a lot, I think. Hello, hello. Hello. Okay, we're here. The mic sound fine? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no idea. Uh, anyways, I was saying that, uh, you know, uh, to have anything sort of like, you know, Burgerland's individualism, which uh, probably comes about precisely because of the origin of Burgerland. You're talking about know, the... <laughs> are, are you talking about what we have now or like what they... Like what the ideal is that they want. Well, no, what we have now. I mean, like this individualism okay. that we we believe in now here in the U.S. Uh, for the yeah. most part, the general ideology, and how that arose partly because of the original reality of precisely that kind of rugged individualism, in which uh, you know people kind of came here and like did homesteading. You know, they fucked off to their own individual little farms, and they didn't really live in this uh, mm -hmm. in a very cohesive like community or communal society yeah. i mean there were people who did i have you know. to dispute this actually uh, most of the settlers and like the northeast lived very communal protestant lives yeah yeah i, I was, I was oh, about yeah. to say that you know i mean like, expect, like obviously like the religious uh, groups did not <laughs> actually fall into this you know they I mean, like, a lot of the uh, founding documents of, you know, the towns in my state uh, sound very communist in many ways, actually. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, uh, once, like, the movement has spread to the uh, the West was starting to happen, you know, it became a lot more common for people to just kind of go screw off and, like... Uh, live on their own, you know, found new towns, but even then, you know, they, they didn't see each other, they didn't see each other as in, in you know, this uh, communal necessity. Yeah. Barely, rarely are there, I mean, to my knowledge, uh, are there towns now that everyone within the community knows each other, you know, maybe a neighborhood or something, but not everyone in the town. <laughs> Well, the way that American towns are structured, too, I mean, everything is very far apart from each mm -hmm. other. Like, everyone a has a big lot, and you have a lot of strip malls and stuff like that. If you go yeah. to Europe, and you go to these villages that are hundreds and hundreds of years old, everything is built around the town center. So everything in that village is, at, at the most, a five-minute walk away from you. So, like, yeah. everyone knows each other, and everyone is, you know, everyone is friendly towards each, each other. And uh, you do have a sense more of, like, a communalist lifestyle, I guess. Yeah, I definitely think uh, town design is uh, a very large, plays a very large role in this issue. Uh, because, you know, in America, you have to drive to get everywhere. You can't just walk, uh, but in Europe, you can walk everywhere. And you see people. It's much, much nicer. I don't know. It depends on what you want. I mean, like, I want people to fuck off, obviously. <laughs> I don't want to know everyone, yeah. but I, I much prefer uh, being able to walk everywhere. Same. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's continue on. So only now, after having considered four moments, four aspects of the primary historical relationships, do we find that man also possesses consciousness. 
but even so not inherent, not pure consciousness. From the start, the spirit is afflicted with the curse of being burdened with matter, which here makes its appearance in the form of agitated layers of air, sounds, in short, of language. Language is as old as consciousness. Language is practical consciousness that exists also for other men. And for that reason alone, it really exists for me personally as well. Language, like consciousness, only arises from the need, the necessity of intercourse with other men. Where there exists a relationship, it exists for me. The animal does not enter into relations with anything. It does not enter into any relation at all. For the animal, its relation to others does not exist as a relation. Consciousness is, therefore, from the very beginning, a social product, and remains so as long as men exist at all. Consciousness is, at first, of course, merely consciousness concerning the immediate sensuous environment, and consciousness the limited connection with other persons and things outside the individual who is growing self-conscious. At the same time, it is consciousness of nature which first appears to man as a completely alien, all-powerful, and unassailable force, with which men's relation is purely animal and by which they are over overawed like beasts. It is thus a purely animal consciousness of nature, natural religion, just because nature is as yet hardly modified historically. We see immediately this natural religion or this particular relation of men to nature is determined by the form of society and vice versa. Here, as everywhere, the identity of nature and man appears in such a way that the restricted relation of men to nature determines their restricted relation to one another, and the restricted relation to one another determines men's restricted relation to nature. Ooh, this is a long ass paragraph. Yeah. On the other hand, man's consciousness of the necessity of associating with the individuals around him is the beginning of the consciousness that he is living in society at all. This beginning is as animal as social life itself at this stage. It is mere herd consciousness, and at this point, man is only distinguished from sheep by the fact that with him consciousness takes the place of instinct or that his instinct is, con is a conscious one. The sheep-like or tribal consciousness receives its further development and extension through increased productivity, the increase of needs, and what is fundamental to both of these, the increased population. With these, their developments division, there develops the division of labor, which was originally nothing but the division of labor in, sex, in this sexual act, then that division of labor which develops spontaneously or naturally by virtue of natural predisposition, e, for example, physical strength, needs, accidents, etc., etc., and so on and so on. Division of labor only becomes truly such from the moment when a division of material and mental labor appears. The first form of ideologist, priest, is concurrent. From this moment onwards, consciousness can really flatter itself that it is something other than consciousness of existing practice, that it really represents something without representing something real. From now on, consciousness is in a position to emancipate itself from the world and to proceed f to the formation of pure theory, theology, philosophy, ethics, etc. But even if this theory, theology, philosophy, ethics, etc. comes into contradiction with the existing relations, this can only occur because existing social relations have come into contradiction with the existing forces of production. This, moreover, can also occur in a particular national sphere of relations to the appearance of the con contradiction, not within the national orbit, but between this national consciousness and the practice of other nations, that is, between national and general consciousness of a nation, as we see it now in Germany. So that was a, a really, really compressed and abstract rundown of the history of the human species up to the modern day. Yeah, so yeah. It being it so long, I'd like to go over it. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking we should go, yeah, start that way, but yeah. So, only now, after having considered four moments, four aspects of the primary historical relationships, do we find that man also possesses consciousness, but even so, not inherent, not pure consciousness. That's what we said before. Uh, and I just think that's bizarre <laughs> i mean really uh you know you've been talking about uh, you know a living animal you know it does things it's been producing its own livelihood and only now do you consider that it has consciousness i mean marx has a higher conception of consciousness than hegel has i mean hegel's conception of consciousness is 
super simple. <laughs> like, yeah, every animal has consciousness. Insofar as, you know, does it have a sense of self? Does it have a sense of other? Yes. Good. It's an animal. It has consciousness. Yeah. You know, so it, uh, one already had to presuppose this isn't some sort of like deduction or conclusion after the fact, you know, you'd have to have consciousness actually prior to these moments, I think. It doesn't really make sense to be talking about it otherwise. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't be talking about uh, going about and doing all the things that we do without already presupposing consciousness. Uh, so, uh, I would say, actually, in all of this, you think consciousness should have been the first moment rather than the fourth. Do you think we his consciousness is a little like Kant's pure reason or something? Uh, I think he's, by consciousness, he actually means self consciousness. Yeah, that's what I thought. And also, like, the awareness of being able to, like, operate on ideas and, you know, form, like, relationships between ideas and objects and things. So that we can do things. Like, you see a tree and you don't see it as just, oh, there's a tree, but you see, like, the things you could do with it or whatever, you know, something like that. Yeah, just so an animal I mean... wouldn't look at a tree as an object that it could use for its own benefit except for like shelter or to climb it or to get away from the predators uh, yeah I mean uh, for example self consciousness is like something even animals have uh, mm. Hegel gives a lot of credit to, to the lower life forms far more than Mars it seems <laughs> yeah. uh, in which uh, far more animals are self conscious than humans and you know people take self-conscious to be like this ooh, really high thing for Hegel it's kind of like yeah. such a basic thing a, a lot of things have it not fully but uh, at least in the, its most minimal aspect in which self-conscious is merely the capacity to uh, have an object before you and recognize it as something like yourself and not not in like in this really like conceptual way but literally just like it's intuitive yeah. sense in which an animal like you know is self-conscious when it it considers its action in consideration of some other conscious being that may be watching yeah. it. I mean, that's so, uh, kind of it. So an animal would be acting and doing, and then it notices that something else is observing it, and then it becomes self-conscious about it. I mean, we do it. We use it in the common sense today, where the the common uh, term today, like. I'm self-conscious about going out into public wearing this or whatever, you know, because you're afraid of what others will <laughs> see you as or whatever. Uh, yep. So from the start, the spirit is afflicted with the curse of being burdened with matter, which here makes its appearance in the form of agitated layers of air, sounds, and short of language. <laughs> Interesting way of phrasing language. I've never seen it uh, as agitated layers of air and also uh -huh. by spirit obviously he's he means mind i mean the term was probably geist and, yeah uh, i mean he's he's aping hegel mind. here uh, yeah i'm not sure to what extent i know hegel mentions a uh, actually i mean hegel loves language because language is literally uh the existence of spirit it is <laughs> it's you know the actual existence of mind so to say hegel refers to it as the agitated layers of air no, this is Marx. Oh, being, okay, I uh, didn't think so. Yeah, this is Marx like doing this stupid uh, positivist, reductive, materialist shit yeah. before it was popular. Yeah, I'm sure I would definitely would have remembered you know, it, that. This is the equivalent of the modern. Uh, you know, it's like, well, you know, we're all just atomic machines. You know, playing <laughs> out the forces of your graph of gravity or whatever. Yeah. You know, we're just a, a whole bunch of quantum mechanical equations. You know, playing them themselves out. You know, consciousness is nothing but an illusion. Yeah. We're scientists. Love is just a chemical reaction in your brain. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> language, is, lang yeah. <laughs> yeah. L language is nothing but, you know, an, an agitated layers of sound, of air, you know, we call sound. So language is as old as consciousness. Language is practical consciousness that exists also for the men. I mean, he's taking that directly from Hegel. And for that reason alone, it really exists for me personally as well. Language like consciousness only arises from the need, the necessity of intercourse with other men.
Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's sort of a... It yeah. makes sense at the same time. I'm not quite sure it really makes sense. In that it, it's not so much... I mean, it's not a need like a desire. You know, it's not that, you know, we want. It's that we just... We're, we're already... It is what we are, you know. If it's there, we're going to take it on. It's what we do. You know, it's literally it's literally our species being, so to say. To form language? Yeah. Or, yeah. You know, we, our mind, if language is present, our mind is primed to take on it, to take yeah. on structures. I can't, I can't remember if Chomsky said Chomsky, that or Chomsky was actually, to that. Yeah, he was opposed to that. Chomsky yeah, I thought uh, so. said it didn't make sense to be talking about a... Uh, language that came about like he was opposed to this this theory that you know the behaviorist theory that language came about because you know some need and he said it doesn't make sense uh, you know it just rather it makes a lot more sense actually that the capacity for language arose and the animals that could do it just started doing it because they could yeah hmm. and indeed that's kind of I think uh that's how I see it. I don't see... You can't have a need for language, and then that's why language developed. It, that doesn't make sense. That's like saying, you know, yeah. why haven't parrots done that? Well, you know, they can... Like, they have the tools for generating language, and yet they don't have a need for it, despite how useful it is. And despite the fact that if we train them, uh, they kind of actually learn. They have... Uh, yeah. There are parrots who they've, they've done experiments. They can recognize some level of intuitive concepts for example they've done some tests on yeah. some parrot i forget wh what it was called uh, it could recognize the color red you know you could place objects before it which were the same shape and ask it look for the you know which is the color red one it'll pick it out and you know that's useful uh, did the parrot recognize it as useful probably not probably. Uh, but nonetheless you know where the heck would this need come from well it would only come from actually already having the capacity of language mm-hmm and a need for a language, well, not a need, but like a, the usefulness of language as expressing more than what it needs to. Yeah, and then itself, you know, it just becomes if a that need. makes sense. <laughs> yeah, well, because I like, mean, okay, if a parrot can pick out a red thing, sure, but why would it need to? It doesn't see it as useful, so it wouldn't need to use language in that way. I mean, they may have their own language, you know, we think animals have languages of their own, but they're not the same as what we would uh, recognize as a language. Either. So, yeah, so that's an out, it's an outdated theory of language. Uh, frankly, I don't care. How, however it came about, it came about. Uh, there's plenty of irrational, contingent reasons for how it could come about. And uh, yeah, whatever even they if are. it were a need, and it, I think it was real in, in some way, uh, just because it's a need doesn't mean you know what the need is and how to reconcile it. So, yeah, it would have to come from somewhere else, whatever Chomsky said. <laughs> Isn't it sort of like a Lamarckian argument? A what argument? Lamarckian. Like, he was I don't know. the guy who talked about evolution before Darwin. Yeah. Yeah, the I certain things. That, yeah, his uh, he was the one that you know, uh, certain traits are picked out and they just get better and better and better and better. You know, it's like uh, that evolution was just the increase of the the capacities already there. You know, getting reinforced. Uh, you know, if you had like a giraffe, you know, and the two long necked giraffes breed, you know, they slowly, slowly the neck just kept getting longer and longer. You know, the giraffe like stretched its neck and it got you know stretched it out just a little bit and then you know bred and it, the next giraffe had a bit longer neck. Blah blah blah. Uh, which is uh, not entirely false. Uh, epigenetics is a thing. Uh, we've definitely found that out. And, you know, eventually, the one thing that we don't know is just how it is that epigenetic, the epi epigenetic uh, phenomena becomes part of the just the general genome. So, you know, somewhere along the way, some animal gets the capacity for reason you know conceptual thought which is what language manifests as and starts using it you know language is just spoken language is just one mode of it 
uh, sign is another, you know, physical hand signs, uh, smells is another. All these sort of things become symbols, language, you know, structures of language, uh, structures of concepts. Uh, so, you know, uh, somewhere along the line, some animal developed a capacity, it passed it on, became more generalized, entered the entire gen general genome, and then you have this whole set of animals which were already social, which then could speak, and there you go. Uh, a speculative history of evolutionary biology. Uh, where he says, where there exists a relationship, it exists for me. The animal does not enter into relations with anything. It does not enter into any relation at all. Uh, I think this is considering a concept in that, you know, the animal doesn't consider its relation to anything a relation. You know, it's not aware of that being a relation. It doesn't conceive itself in that relation. Whereas, obviously, we do, you know. We consider ourselves into relations to other people. You know, we have families, we have friends, we have co-workers, we have the boss, we have the president. Uh, we have strangers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, we have uh, concepts of how we should relate to everyone universally, how we should relate to anybody specifically, etc. Consciousness is therefore, from the very beginning, a social product and remains so long as man ex exists at all. Um, once again, uh, uh, consciousness as such, no, not really. Uh, Self-consciousness, uh, Hegel does agree, is a social product. Uh, like, self-consciousness as such, once fully developed. Uh, although uh, other animals have these moments of self-consciousness, most of them aren't self-conscious as such. You know, they don't... Uh, carry the self-conscious with them. You know, the other consciousness is not considered a constituent of them, it's external. Rather, when you have self-consciousness, the otherness is already within you. You know, literally, you're split. The fact that you have this capacity of self-reflection of like, uh, you know, am I doing the right thing? You think about yourself, that self-consciousness, it's a split between you, uh, your inner self, and that it's not just uh, contingent on, you know, there being actually someone else out there. Although it does originate first from out there. Yeah, it has to. It's the only way you get to that, internaliz in that uh, internalization to begin with. Uh, consciousness is at first, of, of course, merely consciousness concerning the immediate sensuous environment and consciousness of the limited connection with other persons and things outside the individual who is growing self-conscious. Mm. Um, I suppose that's kind of a developmental psychology point, you know, as, as children grow. Uh, at the same time, it is consciousness of nature, which appears to men as a completely alien, all-powerful, and unassailable force, with which men's relations are purely animal, and by which they are overawed like beasts. It is thus a purely animal consciousness of nature, natural religion, just because nature is as yet hardly modified historically. Um... I would not think that uh, animal consciousness has really anything to do with natural religion. I mean, obviously it does as a natural con presupp presupposed condition, but, but uh, I don't think animals as such have uh, natural religion, you know. It's like some people like think in this manner, like, you know, uh, you see it even today. Uh, you know, they say, you know, wow, you know, gods must think we're like kind of some kind of god, for example, you know. It's, we just bring food every day. You know, we can just do shit. You know, things hurt. We give them something. It stops hurting. You know, the gods must think we're... You know, dogs must think we're gods. And, like, the obviousness is, like, your god has no fucking clue. It's just, it's just you. You know, they love you. Uh, natural religion uh, requires something far more advanced than uh, mere animal consciousness. It requires already a very... Uh, mediated social consciousness of cultural conceptions, etc. It, it requires a self-conception. Uh, 
continuing, we see here immediately this natural religion or this particular relation of men to nature is determined by the form of society and vice versa. Um, okay, I mean, I think that's kind of a a jumping the uh, what's it called? Begging the question. He's already presupposing something that he is supposed to be explaining. You know, he's supposed to be explaining society. Uh, and the conscious is based on, you know, arising in society. And then he appeals to society to already give the account of the arising of a natural religion, natural consciousness of that sort. Uh, just seems a, a bad argument, frankly. Uh, on the other hand, man's... Consciousness of the necessity of associating with individuals around him is the beginning of the consciousness that he is living in society at all. Well, okay, obviously. This beginning is as animal as social life itself at this stage. So I suppose he, that actually was meant to say as a social animal, you know, merely a social animal, it's mere herd consciousness. And at this point, man is only distinguished from sheep by the fact that with him consciousness takes the place of instinct, or that his instinct is a conscious one. The sheep-like or tribal consciousness receives its further development and extension through increased productivity, the increase of needs, and what is fundamental to both of these, the increased population. And uh, it's once again strange that he just completely misses out on the, the necessary link of all these things, which is the increase in the conceptual powers of the mind, you know, more and more... Uh, concrete concepts. With these there developed division of labor, which was originally nothing but the division of labor in the sexual act. Uh, I don't know why that, how that can be considered a division of labor, but uh, whatever, man. Like, the labor by that, by that, if sex is labor, and I suppose <laughs> labor just means anything. Uh, I think that's an overstretch of the concept. Uh, then that division of labor which develops spontaneously or naturally by virtue of natural predisposition, for example, physical strength, needs, accidents, etc., etc. So the natural division of labor, you know, by uh, the sexual di di dimorphism. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it happens, yes. Although it's not exactly division of labor in the sense of, you know, it's that it becomes codified in any sense, though some societies do codify it and reify it. Uh, division of labor only becomes truly such from the moment when a division of material and mental labor appears. The first form of ideologist, priest, is concurrent. From this moment onward, consciousness can really flatter itself that it is something other than consciousness of existing practice, that it really represents something without representing something real. From now on, consciousness is in a position to emancipate itself from the world and to proceed to the formation of pure theory, theology, philosophy, ethics, etc. So here's one of the obvious problems that uh, Marx misses out is that he doesn't take thinking to actually be itself a practice. You know, the only practice is physical practice, but he doesn't seem, he doesn't consider that thinking itself is practice. You know, you're doing something. Uh, therefore, obviously, since thinking is a doing, it's a doing of doing, you can do about doing. You know, if uh, you get the gist. Nope. I'm still here. So he's a little disparaging a pure theory, you know, as like, you know, just being delusional about uh, being about something else than, uh, you know, concrete, quote unquote. Uh, uh, practice is, um, I think, missing the point in which well, thinking itself is a concrete practice. 
but even if this theory, theology, philosophy, ethics, etc., comes into contradiction with the existing relations, this can only occur because existing social relations have come into contradiction with existing forces of production. Uh, but that, in a way, seems to me nonsense. Uh, in that, uh, although I'll admit here I'm my ignorance, so you know I could be wrong, and uh, I'll eventually find out if I am wrong on this. But I don't think that the fall of Greece had anything to do with just like developments of technology. Uh, obviously, uh, Marx earlier talks about the very relations of production, the way the ways of the very way of life as itself a force of production. So technically, he's right. But I think that's cheating. Like that's just gaming the definition to cover all bases such that you can't be wrong. So that when you say it in a certain sense later on and somebody goes, but wait, that doesn't make sense. You know, here's the thing that contradicts it. He could say, ah, but what I really meant was, you know, remember that one thing I said about the thing? It covers the base. And it just doesn't make sense. Because it's basically just uh, subsuming everything into this concept of the forces of production when you can easily distinguish them from the forces of production you can call it the ideal the ideology or you know the superstructure but he ultimately just wants to bring that down and say no 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 it's really the forces of production you see therefore it was just like a, it's it's like certain ideas right now that uh, or have some popularity about how ideas themselves are technologies Therefore, and this is actually, actually, I hadn't thought about this, but it's a very Marxist thing. Since ideas themselves are tools, are, are technologies uh, to deal with the world, therefore you can talk that if the ideas change, literally the forces of production have changed. And, you know, it's a sort of cascading effect. You know, the ideas change, obviously, the relations of production as well as the forces of production uh, get changed. But uh, that just makes forces of production really such a general thing that just, to me, it, it's meaningless. Uh, what do you think, Hyperion? Uh, I came back during the middle of that, but, yeah, I agreed with what you what I heard <laughs> basically uh, I think when you left uh, I was talking about how uh, he disparages pure theory you know as a as sort of uh, falling into an illusion that it's uh, independent from the practical world you know the actual lived world uh, yeah you know uh, he says for the, from this moment onwards consciousness can really flatter itself that it is something other than consciousness of existing practice that it really represents something without representing something real. Oh, you know, yeah. from now on, consciousness is on a is in a position to emancipate itself from the world and to proceed to the formation of pure theory, theology, philosophy, ethics, etc. And uh, here, Marx is obviously like treating consciousness as if, or thinking as if, it itself is not a practice, as if it's uh, it itself is not a doing. But you know, what we have come to find out is actually no, uh, thinking is a doing. Therefore, it is a practice. Therefore, it can practice on itself. I mean that's how you get pure theory. So you can have its own; de it can have its own developments uh, outside of the other developments uh, and beyond the other. N not outside uh, as such, but within and beyond. You know, transcending the other developments as such. And then I was talking about the next sentence, but that where he says, you know, that. Uh, even if theory seems to go beyond and have a contradiction with the existing relations, it's only because the existing social relations have come into contradiction with existing forces of production. Which, if we're talking about technology, that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not true. You know, you can go beyond without having any new technological developments aren't exactly what led Plato to, you know, talk about a society that didn't exa exactly exist in Greece. Even though it was based on fundamental presuppositions of Greek life, it wasn't really reflective of Greek um, life as concrete in the material sense. But, you know, when Greek, Greece fell apart, it, it's hard for me to believe that it was because of technology, uh, technological advances, you know, within Greece, you know, just tearing through and making a, 
you know, it's slave society, not viable anymore. Rather, you know, Greece just kind of fell apart because, yeah, its life fell apart. But I was uh, also noting that, you know, Marx <laughs> earlier treats that very same thing, the very way of life, as a forced production. Therefore, you know, he can always come back and uh, cover his bases, you know, on anything and everything and say, but it ultimately is a forced production because he has defined it that way, even though it really doesn't make sense to me. You know, it's kind of a uh, abusing uh, definitional boundaries, in my opinion. It's a, a bit of cheating, in a way, to always define yourself to being right. Yeah, Do you agree on that. that? Yeah, I can see that. It just loses its specificity and then ultimately uh, it's too general or too uh, abstract. Yeah, it's the prior paragraph, that small paragraph where he says... Uh, it follows from this that a certain mode of production or industrial stage is always combined with a certain mode of cooperation or social stage, and this mode of cooperation is itself a productive force. So the very way of life is itself a force of production. Therefore, if the way of life, which is also a way of thinking, which is also a way of self-conception, which is also a way of self-understanding, changes, he can always say, ah, but it was always the force of production. Even though at that point you're talking about things that don't clearly, you know, meld down into just production, and it's it's a we it's a, a sleazy way to define it, in my opinion. So to finish that one off and to finally finish off the section with the next paragraph. Uh, <laughs> this moreover can also occur in a particular national sphere relations to the appearance of the contradiction, not within the national orbit, but between this national consciousness and the practice of other nations. That is, between the national and the general consciousness of a nation, as we see it now in Germany. So, you know, the change can also come from outside because someone else just beat you to the punch on technology or ID or forces production or whatever. Uh, it's still a sleazy way of defining, in my opinion. Um, continuing, moreover, it is quite immaterial what consciousness starts to do on its own. Out of all such muck, we get only the, the one inference that these three moments, the forces of production, the state of society, and consciousness, can and must come into contradiction with one another. Because the division of labor implies the possibility, nay, the fact that intellectual and material activity, enjoyment and labor, production and consumption, devolve on different individuals, and that the only possibility of their not coming into contradiction lies in the negation in its turn of the division of labor. It is self-evident, moreover, that specters, bonds, the higher being, concept, scruple, are merely the idealistic, spiritual expression, the conception apparently of the isolated individual, the image of the very empirical fetters and limitations within which the mode of production of life in the form of intercourse, coupled with it, move. So, I mean, uh, part of it is, uh, I think he's uh, just empirically wrong. <laughs> <laughs> empirically wrong about... Well, yeah, about like the whole... This is criticism you know, of idealists. Thing. Well, no, empirically Actually. wrong about that these three moments have to come into contradiction. Mm. Oh, yeah. That, uh, we see these long, and I mean long-lasting, stable societies for that lasted thousands of years. Basically changing very very little as far as we can tell and obviously we're missing a huge chunk of historical record uh, yeah. to say that, you know that nothing changed but it seems that nothing fundamentally and significantly changed uh, technologically as well as you know uh, socially you know Egypt uh, is one of those things uh, obviously technologies and methods of certain things got better their philosophies became their theologies became more complex uh, but, you know, did something fundamentally change? They changed, but they didn't fundamentally change. 
uh, China is also one of those, and India is also one of those in which they had like, long-running traditions and things didn't specifically change. So there are instances in which uh, you know the contradiction could only the contradiction is there, obviously the latency, but boy, in the time scales, it is a long, long coming contradiction that can seemingly be staved mm -hmm. off with a uh, quite a bit of stability. But you're not saying that the uh... Like the changes came about immediately, and then things devolved. Yeah, they don't come. It had to have been gradual. Yeah, they it are had gradual, to have been gradual change. But yeah. at the same time, it's not like this really like abrupt change <laughs> either. I mean, there yeah, there is like it takes day. a certain my it takes a certain mindset really. It, it's and uh. That's kind of where that's kind of where this theory of history like breaks down, and why Marx kind of also abandons it. He realizes it just doesn't work. Like he realizes it's kind of a, he was taking assumptions from the peculiarities of Europe, and that this doesn't really apply to the rest of the world. It's not really a theory of history in which all peoples go through these stages, and therefore, uh, insofar as we take it as that, this isn't ultimately actually a theory of history at all you know <laughs> yeah. that's really more of a a mere record uh, history you know this is how things happened in Europe rather than this is how things have to happen in order for progression to occur mm -hmm. although I mean obviously I think those three elements when allowed to go to their logical developments, do, cla do clash, will clash, and necessarily destabilize. But you know, whether that happens in, between, within one country or between various countries or within a world system is a whole contingency of history. And uh, which is why, by the way, I mean, you see something like in Hegel's philosophy of history, he doesn't really, he's not too bothered by trying to give an empirical account of like, history as such you know the record was just uh, broken as hell and empty we still have major gaps today mm -hmm. and so he just kind of went by structures and he said look you know certain logical structures were expected at the beginning if we have these you know and if we took them to logical conclusions we'd have some sort of uh, movements to other things and therefore you know let's look to see if there's anywhere else in the world that instantiates such a kind of thing uh here you go and then you kind of move that way like it's not a really a a winding thread, you know, going from one nation to another, you know, in which uh, there's any specific historical link in which we learned from each other, for example. Uh, Hegel wasn't that optimistic, even though I think there's some optimism nowadays to say we have significant links to say that we do have links of those things. Although they're not large links, there are links such that we could right we could sort of wind a thread you know from india to china to greece all the way through the rest of this history of europe uh, the only people who we probably uh, wouldn't have much of a connection to would be you know the people on the other side of the world in the americas but even then you know mm -hmm. the, there's the whole theory of you know they really well obviously they must have come from like some European migration or from Africa or something, you know, they weren't just there, right? You know, they splintered off from us yeah, at I don't some know. historical <laughs> point. Yeah. Oh, the Tower of Babel. <laughs> uh, point is, I mean, uh, ultimately this theory doesn't work out. Marx seems to abandon it. Uh, and uh, it's just kind of a curiosity certain things about it are you know make sense the whole the emphasis on the material life is obviously necessary it's good uh, the pointing out of the modes of production forces of production you know uh, uh, this the state of society which I don't know if uh, he means the state <laughs> oh uh, no but either I, way I mean there, there, could, there, the there are obviously the Latent contradictions and all of this. Yeah. Oh, and here there's another section on private property and communism. Though we'll save that for next time. We have yeah. about one third left. I 
I did want to say, uh, someone I regularly talk to thinks that I don't want to name drop them, but you know, they don't, they would probably wouldn't want to, but, uh, they think that there can be no cohesive, uh, history of, uh, or sorry, uh, I guess philosophy of history as a, you know, this is how history develops or whatever type thing. And I'm inclined to agree with them to some degree, but also, like when I refer to Hegel's philosophy of history, as you said, it's not, this is how things are and develop, or this is how a thread goes from one to another or anything like that. I think we could make, uh, obviously, a, a cohesive uh, philosophy of history, but it would be so complex that the task would be like beyond a single person to even do. Uh, it's impossible. So, um, yeah, I mean, there there are uh, there's a, a very big chunk of history of which we will miss. We don't have the thread, and uh, mm -hmm. unless we find like some tablet or something that holds a like, significant amount of records like we're just going to have that thread lost like we can't make a thread for example uh for a lot of uh india to china it, partly because the goddamn chinese emperors and their stupid imperial wars uh, love to book burn so we lost yeah. a lot of history there and uh a lot of uh, records in history are just, uh, you know, lost. I mean, God, even things that, you know, you think people would have prized and that somebody would have them are lost. We, we don't have, we don't have Plato's lectures. We don't have Aristotle's uh, dialogues. Uh, we don't have plenty of other people's, you know, corpus. Um, and I mean, that's uh, things that, you know, people of uh, great insight to prize and those are lost to history let alone, you know, these detailed records of connections. But, uh, yeah, I mean, like, this, the philosophy of history is coherent. It's just incomplete. Yeah. And it's always going to be incomplete, and it, that's always the, the assumption, because we don't have that record. The whole point of the philosophy of history is to say, looking at the record of history from, you know, the oldest states, the most recent states, uh, there's a logical ordering as to why you know, these older states were the way they were, you know, there is a more, they have more primitive notions, more basic notions of freedom, you know, and the closer you get starting moving to modernity, the more recent things, the more advanced concepts they have. Why does this make sense? Well, obviously, because we learn. Where that learning comes from, of course, we don't quite know, because we have that part of the records missing. Mm. But that's all it is. I mean, it's just an explanation of, like, given history... Why does history, the historical uh, succession of, you know, the states have the order that it does? And, you know, and it makes sense. Uh, the only thing I, I think, like uh, I've said it before, I think the idea of class struggle uh, should be added into uh, the philosophy of history. The idea of the history of techniques, the history of, you know, the, the forces of production needs to be added to the philosophy of history. You know, because Hegel actually thinks it's important. He thinks he talks about science and scientific technical developments, but he doesn't talk about it enough uh, to show that certain technical developments obviously led to the supersession of states. Uh, likewise, you know, the uh, class struggles led to the downfall of states, etc., etc. Uh, but unlike Marx, uh, I don't think uh, you can give prime importance to those struggles themselves as having been generative of the next forms that came about. Like, you know, you don't go from slave society, you know, uh, and, you know, the slaves uprise, and then you have serfdom. That doesn't fucking make sense. Uh, you know, you'd think they just want to be free people. No, apparently, you know, they thought, it's like, oh, let's reinvent the king all this. It, it just, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It doesn't really follow. Uh, the only thing that follows is, well, there's a new structure of freedom. It's freer, and, you know, therefore, you know, it's logically posterior. But yeah. that's about it. You know, what it was and how it, stru you know, was structured is just kind of a historical contingency. Yeah, we don't know that they didn't want genuine freedom, but, you know, they had to make concessions or whatever. All right, and I thought we were going to leave it here, but no, this is really yeah. short, so let's just finish it. <laughs> All the way to the end? 
But yeah, I mean, it's like two more pages, man. Yeah. Yeah, but it's going to be another hour of us talking about it. No, because the rest is footnotes. Literally, it's two more pages until we finish. <laughs> okay. Uh, private property and communism. With the division of labor in which all these contradictions are implicit and which in its turn is based on the natural division of labor in the family and the separation of society into individual families opposed to one another, is given simultaneously the distribution, and indeed the unequal distribution, both quantitative and qualitative, of labor and its products, hence property. The nucleus, the first form of which lies in the family, where wife and children are the slaves of the husband, uh, obviously historically not true, already mentioned, this latent slavery mm -hmm. in the family, though still very crude, is the first property, but even at this early stage it corresponds perfectly to the definition of modern economists, who call it the po power of disposing of the labor power of others. Division of labor and the private property are, moreover, identical expressions. In the one, the same thing is affirmed with reference to activity as affirmed in the other with the reference to the productive, to the productive activity. Um, that just seems like obviously wrong. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you know, uh, primitive communists have division of labors and yet they don't have private property. You know, a woman hunt, uh, women go and like pick berries, you know, hunt fish, uh, you know, maybe do a little bit of other kinds of hunting. Men, you know, go and like chop wood, the, uh, you know, get the wild horses, whatever, you know, hunt the buffalo, I don't know. And then they bring it off and, you know, the whole community shares in that. You know, where's the private property in that? Uh, that, that doesn't seem to be true. Hmm. It's also just Maybe it's like, that universal private property he was just <laughs> discussing. Well, no, I mean, like, he, this is literally Marx yeah. doing exactly what he later uh, uh, rags on bourgeois economists for doing, which is he's projecting yeah. the present into the past. Exactly. Because only in the modern division of labor does that imply private property. In the old division, in the former divisions of labor, there is no such distinction, you know. The fact that you do this and the fact that I do that only means that we do this and you do that. And we come back together and we share the spoils of what we brought together. Uh, yeah. Well, no maybe it would have... Would it me the, uh, excuse, excuse me there. Maybe it would have made more sense if he had said something like, you know, in the modern day, we do have, or in his time anyway, the division of labor was a lot more or was a lot more rigid than what it was in primitive communism. Like assuming that you know, uh, in primitive communism, if you had a division of labor, it wasn't necessarily something that was like institutionalized by repression. It was just something that came about because it was easier to do, per se. Like I, I don't even know. I'm kind of rambling there. But well, no, yeah, I'm thinking it makes about sense. like. Yeah. I'm also thinking about some sort of like privileging of the of the patriarch, like uh, also like uh, the privileging of the of the best hunters, like they would get the best cut of meat. Is that a private property? I don't know. So would that be considered some sort of private property? Uh, no, nah. I don't know. Uh, I mean, look, look, so? it's, no. I think he's literally just doing the the economist uh, thing. He's projecting into the past. Uh, it's mainly because I've read uh, what's uh, Levine's book on uh, on the classical economists. This is very mm -hmm. much a very a thing they did. Yeah, you know, very economistic, uh, very reductive, and uh, very much uh, ahistorical. Which is not surprising. I mean, the fact that here Marx is really bent on, you know, I'm being scientific, you know, so I'm being like the political economist, you know, I'm finding the universal laws of uh, the production of human society. Well, obviously, it's not so. And uh, I'm pretty confident in saying that he uh, does not hold this, you know, by the time of capital. Oh, definitely. He may have been taken. Further, the division of labor implies the contradiction between the interests of the separate individual or the individual family and the communal interest of all individuals who have intercourse with one another. I wonder if he means it also in the, you know, the other sense. <laughs> and indeed, this communal interest does not exist merely in the imagination as the general interest. 
but first of all, in reality, as the mutual interdependence of the individuals among whom the labor is divided. And finally, the division of labor offers us the first example of how, as long as man remains in natural society, that is, as long as a cleavage exists between the particular and the common interest, as long, therefore, as activity is not voluntarily but naturally divided, man's own deed becomes an alien power opposed to him, which enslaves him instead of being controlled by him. For as soon as the distribution of labor comes into being, each man is a particular exclusive sphere of activity, which is forced upon him and from which he cannot escape. He is a hunter, a fisherman, a herdsman, or a critic, or a critical critic. It must remain so if he does not want to lose his means of livelihood. While in communist society, where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes, society regulates the general production and thus makes it impossible makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner just as I have in mind, and without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critic. Famous line right there. Absolutely famous line. And let me tell you, it is one fucking bullshit line. Because <laughs> it's totally against the very thing he wants to convey. And, uh, and the reason... He, because notice that all these things are not social things. You can do all these things all by yourself. No need for a boss, no need for your neighbor. So it's uh, very interesting how a social, the concept of social freedom is. This fixation of social activity, this consolidation of what we ourselves produce into an objective power above us, growing out of our control, thwarting our expectations, bringing to naught our calculations, is one of the chief factors in historical development up till now. So, I mean, uh, definitely quite a few things to critique here, um, especially considering the division of labor. You know, he says... Uh, about the third sentence there. And finally, the division of labor offers us as the first example of how as long as man remains in natural society, that is, as long as a cleavage exists between the particular and the common interest, as long, therefore, as activity is not voluntary but naturally divided, man's own deed becomes an alien power opposed to him, which enslaves him instead of being controlled by him. For as soon as the distribution of labor comes into being, each man has a particular exclusive sphere of activity, which is forced upon him and from which he cannot escape. And as much as we can hate capitalism, this is just not true. Uh, at least not for us in the first world. You know, if in the third world, even then, it's not completely true, though it's mostly true. Uh, nowadays, you're born, and if your dad's a doctor, uh, there's no need for you to be a doctor. You know, there's no necessity. There's no one forcing you, except for you know your dad probably, because you know, maybe you're one of those families in which you're, you're going to be a doctor and you're going to be like, and you're going to like it or something. But uh, you don't, even then, you don't, you know, there's no necessity. You assent to it because, you know, it's your dad, and you're like, oh, I got to make dad happy. But uh, you can choose to be anything else. You can choose to search any form of livelihood that you can find, which is to your liking. You know, whether what it is that you really want to do is something that you can do is another question. But that you have a choice is not a question. You can be a teacher. Uh, doesn't mean you can be the teacher that you want to be or teach what you want to teach. Uh, you have to be lucky and find people who actually will be willing, willing to pay you. I mean, uh, nobody who is born today and becomes a YouTube video game Let's Player, for example, is being forced into that and goes, Oh, woe be me. I can only play video games and sit on my ass and talk shit all day. Uh, they're pretty happy with what they're doing and they choose to be there. And uh, they can choose to move on from it if they feel like it too, you know. So uh, whether they whether they can find some other form of employment such that they can put it on the resume. They're like, oh, you were a video game player for like 10 years. Um, yeah, you know, uh, that's kind of problematic for this company. Your skills don't quite transfer. But uh, yeah, other than that, you're not, there is no natural division of labor here. Like in capitalism, this is one of the things, Marx here makes a mistake and he, it's a mistake he maintains all the way through capital. He mistakes this to be a natural division of labor. Capitalism is not a natural division of labor. It's totally a social arbitrary division of labor. The fact that, you know, there are people in China dying to make you fucking iPhones is not a natural necessity at all. Uh, you know, the fact that we have a, a whole system of miserable teachers teaching all the way from kindergarten to university and none of them are happy, it's not a natural, it's not a natural necessity. Uh, for the most part, uh, 
believe you me, capitalists are trying to get rid of just pretty much everything except for, you know, basic mathematics, basic language. And uh, so long as you can, like, click buttons on a computer and uh, follow those pretty pictures, they'd be happy. Quite happy if you didn't know anything else. So, I mean, that's just, uh, it's just a false critique, you know, it's a false uh, con conception of what life is under capitalism. You're not really stuck. You know, you're, it's not a natural, it's not given like in the old days uh, where, you know, if you're born to the blacksmith, well, you're going to grow up to be a blacksmith, you know, what else is there for you to do? It's also not the case that if you're born a woman, nowadays, more so than ever, still, uh, you know, there are barriers, but the barriers are disappearing. In which uh, you can more or less just start being anything you feel like. Ah, oh, damn it. How long did I go did I DC? Uh, hello? Oh, I don't know if you DC'd or not. It's just, like, I've been trying to interject for, like, yeah. <laughs> the whole time. And it felt I felt like you kept cutting me off, and I was like, what are you doing? You know? Oh, uh, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I guess so. <laughs> I thought you were being rude, and I was like, this is not like you. Because I was trying to explain what I thought he meant by naturally. Uh, the nat By naturally, I, I always took it to mean that he meant, like, what's expected or what's already present, rather than a natural force, you know? Just something that's not given as a voluntary thing, such as, uh, like you said, my father is a surgeon therefore i become a surgeon because it's expected of me but i may voluntarily not want to be a surgeon so i choose to be something else uh when you said something about video game players wanting to do that yeah they probably do if they choose to do that rather than something else online or whatever but they may not you know want to work at mcdonald's it may be preferable they may not care about video games as much as we think they might you know so they may well given the sphere of communism you know like within communism, within being able to actualize themselves, what they actually want to do, they may choose to do something completely different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. But I don't blame... Yeah, but I try not to blame everyone who is not doing exactly what they claim to want to be doing just because you know the, the, I don't know their specific circumstances or whatever of course like um, universal labor I mean people it, it's accepted within the society today that universal labor appears as a vital component of the human experience within our capitalist system but you know as Marx observed uh, like it, it it's not that capitalism is just uh, some mode of production among many but rather that uh, 
you know, the logic of excess, which was already latent, you know, uh, rendered invisible by, you know, some sort of false stability or whatever, and then explodes. Like, I don't know. You know what I, my fear is, right? Like, total automation, you know, a, an automated post scarcity future society, I guess, where, well, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I just think about the worst uh, apocalyptic uh, outcome, but, you know, the majority of workers are deemed redundant and thus summarily starved or killed or whatever, you know. But if that were to come about and that didn't happen, you know, we got a universal stipend or something, the majority of workers wouldn't have to work all the time and could focus on what they would like to do. But their work, their instrumental activity, which is literally work, uh, would be enough for them to, you know, whatever they're f fulfilled with doing uh, would be their work. So I don't see that as a problem. I'm trying to think about what my original, uh, how to link that to my original idea, but of what he was saying here, but I, I, well, I mean, obviously, it. he wants people to be uh, free to, yeah, of course, to do like, whatever I they do, like. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do one thing with my life. Like, do we read every night? Uh, most nights, but sometimes we want to watch a movie. Sometimes we want to do this other thing, of, you know, whatever. Just talk casually because we don't, we're not feeling about, you know, talking about theory or whatever. But it's still instrumental activity. It's still quote unquote work. It just so yeah. happens that our hobbies seem more intellectual, I guess, than the average person's hobby. Yeah, and I mean, that's also part of the logic of capitalism, in which uh, there is a need for, like, uh, basically working, uh, and there cannot be any letting off of that pressure, uh, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the system does not work. Yeah. Mental labor is labor, though. I mean, just because I don't want to hunt or fish or whatever, still. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, those are those are all individual things, and it's it's telling. And I think I like Winfield makes a critique of this. He's like, it's telling that he mentions all the things he mentions are not social. Yeah, you know, they're purely it is individual. True. You know, I mean, therefore, remember Marx how he... cannot imagine his. So Marx here either, you know, just kind of like a, either realized or he just really couldn't imagine what a free sociality really is like. Mm -hmm. Because it's one thing to say, I get to do everything I do that I want. But yeah. you and I know that's not a real conception of freedom. That's not a real conception that's a real freedom that can be had in society. Like, it cannot be just your personal yeah. whims. You know, freedom doesn't mean that. So, yeah, maybe you know, he had in mind... Maybe he had in mind he hunts for like the food that he could provide to the community, fishes for fish that could provide to the community, herd herding cattle or whatever, and critiquing people in a group, you know, having yeah. dinner with a bunch of people. But you know, it's not necessarily a social activity. Yeah. But remember how he said in the uh, remember how he said in the eighteen forty four manuscripts how uh, things that he does on his own are like social labor. It's yeah, not. It's I mean, we had that critique. Yeah. It. yeah, it's expanding yeah. too much. Too but either way, once you start putting it that way, however, supposing that you're a shitty hunter, I'm sorry, like your community is probably not going to want your shit. Supposing that you just <laughs> suck at fishing, like nobody's going to care. Uh, you know, when you're talking about the, the social labor here, um, we're talking about like modes of dependencies. And so mm. really the only thing Marx can ever be talking about is ultimately asocial things. That unless, because if it, it is a social thing, it is an actual social labor, we're talking about it's no longer up to me. I can't be yeah. a hunter if nobody wants me to be hunting. Yeah, it you requires know, I, precision. Yeah, you know, I can't be a fisherman if I nobody mean, learn, wants me to be fishing. Because uh, you would have the time to be able to learn to fish or whatever, but, you know, maybe it's not for everyone, but they still like it. Yeah, but it's also so, the case that uh, people have, yeah. in the social relations, somebody must want you. To be doing yeah. that, otherwise it's not social. You're doing it for yourself, but it's not a social deed. It's not a social expression, and yep. that's kind of the problem. In capitalism, it is a social expression. You only do work because somebody wants you to. You know, they pay you. Uh, you produce things because of the expectation that somebody wants it. You know, because you want to make money off of it, uh, and so you have a lot of leeway. But that leeway is always 
uh, limited by what other people want. And yet that's the only real social way that it can ever work, logically speaking. Uh, unless you're talking about some sort of gift thing, in which case uh, then uh, you're not really doing things. You're doing things with a sort of social intention, but the thing itself cannot ultimately be social. You know, you have some sort of thing. You're like, oh, I'm going to gift it to you. Well, what if I didn't want your gift? You're like, oh, well, thank you. And then I, you know, throw in the dumpster. And that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's nice. It's a nice thought, but uh, okay. The thought that counts. Yeah, I, I agree with like uh, instrumental activity when doing a social favor, I would say. Uh, it's not just the thought that counts. It has to be something that actually benefits the community or whatever. Or it should be. It ought yeah, to be. So, so basically, uh, you don't get to do... Ultimately, you're not going to get to do, even this scenario, anything that you <laughs> want. It's not Unless really, you are... <laughs> unless you're a unless caveman. Some, or unless uh, you're fishing technique is so ridiculous that you could just film it and people would find it entertaining or something <laughs> yeah yeah uh, which is basically what happens with 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 the youtube like people you know who've gotten yeah. famous like they were made stupid videos they never intended to like become famous but then it became famous then it becomes their life and so there yeah. you know now there is a career like you know video gamer or whatever uh, didn't exist before you know and that's a possibility that happens just because people start wanting what you'd want and they're willing to pay you for it bizarre mm -hmm. but hey it, that's kind of one of the freedoms of a non-planned society actually you can figure out things that people didn't know they wanted and then they realize they want it and they'll pay you you know society gives you something for it and uh that's ultimately one of the the weird things about mars you know he really wants this whole cohesive of society thing and at the same time he doesn't want the price that ultimately comes with that cohesive society you know, the price that comes with planned e economies, you know, the, the planned production is you're going to be stuck doing something that you don't want. Why? Because you got to be doing something, you know, until you get to post-production, you know, super production, in which case, uh, you know, whether you want to be doing something or not is, you know, irrelevant. Uh, whether it's you're, what you're doing is social or not is going to be irrelevant. You know, nobody needs you. And therefore, there's a whole slew of problems that could come about with that in my my opinion, yeah. depending on, like, you know. But either way, uh, Marx wants society, and yet he wants really to not have the cost and the price of having society, uh, both in, you know, the uh, social sense as well as the material sense. So in, in a way, Marx's, Marx's idea of society is highly antisocial, in my opinion. <laughs> At least when it comes to economics, you know, when it comes to talking about alienation, it's very social. You know, so it seems like a very beautiful thought. But when he talks about it in concrete uh, economic terms, it's very antisocial. You know, which is why uh, the way I think Marx really intends all these things is really he thinks we're just going to be creative artists at the end of history, or rather. You know, that's yeah. what he calls the beginning of history, although by that point, I think history is pretty much over in, in any meaningful sense. <laughs> in which all we're going to be doing is... Um, we don't know. I mean, we'd have to have it in to, to be able to critique it. And new things, new shapes of old things are going to come about. And it's, yeah. I think that's really... I think Hegel's right about that, you know... Uh, because we see it post Hegel, I don't see anybody who has come up with anything new, like as a mode of thinking after Hegel. Even Marx falls right back into Hegel. Uh, you know, everything that you find in Marx is already a category within Hegel. It's yeah, you know, is there a, you know, is it was it really the end of history? One could kind of say it was. If one's talking about some sort of chronological history, well, obviously history continues. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, history as a history of development, that's, I think, uh, one can conceive of it as reaching a sort of end. Although new things will arise, but they will not be ultimately fundamentally new. So, you know, communism is basically, we're all artists and we are all sharing art with each other. And we all want art from each other. 
which is a nice thought and uh, you know I kind of uh, would like a, a society in which that was a possibility yeah sounds nice but of course not everyone would appreciate everyone's art yeah yeah <laughs> it's not utopian in that sense I mean utopia I've always thought is something that we strive towards not that we ever actually achieve Sure thing, Fichte. <laughs> so continuing, the social power that is the multiplied productive force which arises through the cooperation of different individuals as it is determined by the division of labor appears to these individuals since their cooperation is not voluntary but has come about naturally, not as their own united power but as an alien force existing outside them, of the origin and goal of which they are ignorant, which they thus cannot control, which on the contrary passes through a peculiar series of phases and stages independent of the will and the action of man, nay, even being the prime governor of these. So once again, I mean, this this a social you know, strangeness to, to Marx. He loves society, but he hates society. He hates the need of society. And, you know, and like, what is he describing here? Any, I mean, if not the very dream society of, uh, who is it? <laughs> Adam Smith, you know, the idea that we're all in produ independent producers and we only come together in the market to share our excesses voluntarily. This is the neoclassical myth. You know, oh, you know, we all just, Literal we don't idealism. have to. We just, you know, we just come about, you know, because we want to, you know. Society came about because we all wanted to, you know. We could have lived alone, but we just came together because we wanted to. Obviously, that's not a reality. It doesn't work in, yeah. It doesn't it's really work. work uh, empirically it's going to not happen so you know not only has that never happened uh, if it ever happens it's only it only happens because society is over yeah there is no such thing as society anymore because this, the system of society no longer exists there is no system there is no ne no necessary link between anyone y you no longer have to rely on anybody you don't have to rely on on community, you don't have to rely on any. You don't have to rely on a farmer to give you food. You don't have to rely on a, a person to be teaching you things. You come together as you will, and you split as you will. It'll be like Discord communities, you know, like internet communities. <laughs> they come together yeah. because they want to, and they split because hey, you know, drama happens, and they say fuck you. Yeah, and it, and you know, none of these matter because they're all frivolous, and that's basically what it the end of history at this point is everything's frivolous you know you don't need to be with anybody so you can split you can come together and split as you will and as you want and none of it really ever means anything none of it really has any importance whatsoever jeez that discord analogy is hitting hard because you know how many times we've like formed different communities and then split and then we come back and we're like hey to old people and you know it's just ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's pure sociality, you know, when the only yeah. thing that connects you is just merely uh, wanting to be there in social interest, uh, all that really is of value is the sociality itself, and uh, that has all its problems and it never goes away. So, uh, to finish it off, last paragraph. How otherwise could, for instance, property have had a history at all, have taken on different forms and landed property, for example, according to the different premises given, have proceeded in France from parcellation to centralization in the hands of a few, in England from centralization in the hands of a few to parcellation, as, it, uh, as is actually the case today? Or how does it happen that trade, which after all is nothing more than the exchange of products of various individuals and countries, rules the world through the relation of supply and demand, a relation which, as an English economist says, hovers over the earth like the fate of the ancients and with invisible hand allots fortune and misfortune to men, sets up empires no, and overthrows right. empires, causes nations to rise and disappear, while with the abolition of the basis of private property, with the communistic regulation of production, and implicit in this, the destruction of the alien relation between men and what they themselves produce, the power of the relation of supply and demand is dissolved into nothing and men get exchange, production, them. the mode of the mutual relation under their own control again. I like how it ends with a question, because... You know. 
Of course, he has uh, no idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, as the wizard observed, uh, uh, our task is to ask the right questions, not the right answers. <laughs> Sounds Which like I think a true is philosopher. Yeah, yeah. I I find it kind of bullshit. Not bullshit, but like uh, cheap. Sure, you need to ask the right questions, but you should try to provide your answers, of course. Hey, I'm just asking questions here. I'm not trying to provide any <laughs> positive uh, theory. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. If you're asking questions like play, like a uh, sorry, Socrates. Where you're just trying to get the other person to capitulate by thinking for themselves, like through what you think they should be asking or whatever, provide asking them different things, knowing the answer. <laughs> then sure, <laughs> but <laughs> not just asking questions and then saying you come up with the answer. But yeah, do you agree with the question here? Is this a doing a uh, fucking long we question. Be asking. Like, how long was that? Yeah, I know. Jesus Christ. Yeah, it was like almost one. <laughs> like almost like fucking ten lines. Yeah, that's the whole the whole paragraph, isn't it? No, half no, it paragraph. starts at a war. Yeah, half the paragraph. I do like that quote hovers over the earth like the fate of the ancients and the invisible hand lots. Fortune and misfortune to men. Obviously I don't agree with it, but interesting, I mean. Turn a phrase. Um, yeah, it's, a... it's catchy. I mean, I understand why people say the invisible hand of the market because it is a catchy term. You know, it's a a thought that uh, seems uh, interesting. Like the invisible hand is supposed to know what to do. We don't know what to do as individuals. We screw it up, but the invisible hand is always there to correct it. <laughs> it's like a, a abstract notion of God. God's gonna fix everything. Yeah, yeah, kind of like, uh, you know, the blind autistic hand. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, I don't know. Uh, it's just not much to say there, really. Uh, mm. Like, that's just a weird sentence. Like, half of it's uh, one question, the other half is another. You know, one is like, how how is it that, you know, trade has come to dominate the world, and, you know, and... Things become alienated, you know, a while with the abolition of the basis of private property, with the communistic regulation of production and implicit in this is the destruction of the alien relation between men and what they themselves produce. The power of the relation of supply and demand is dissolved into nothing, and men get exchange production in the mode of the mutual relation under their own control again. I don't know how that makes sense as a question. It seems like a statement. Like he's asking, like, oh, you, know, yeah. you know, how is this possible then, as if it's already happened when it, it hasn't? Yeah. How is it possible that this is determined? If this wasn't, you know, you know, <laughs> you know, it's basically, yeah, like, because that's how the whole paragraph flows, you know, how otherwise yeah. could, for instance, you know, it's like, if this wasn't true, then how come communism is here? Well, <laughs> it isn't, Marx. It, yeah. It's not here. How is it that communism is, deter is, is definitely going to happen then? If dialectics were not true, as you say, then how come this rock turned into a monkey? Oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, anyways, I mean, uh... I, I, I mean, the, the biggest problem I just have with the whole entire section is uh, the implication that uh, the economy is natural. Uh, I mean, obviously, the the need for you know feeding ourselves and maintaining the species is, is a natural need, but the economy is not really existing for that, and, and hmm. that's the clearest thing today. Like, the economy does not exist to meet natural needs; it exists to meet a whole range of frivolous needs, and it's, indeed, natural needs in them themselves are considered frivolous needs. Everything is considered luxury. It's not a system about natural needs. It's not a natural system. Yeah. Uh, is communism an inevitability, as we've asked, like, for 
for years now. I don't know, but it's certainly not natural. And but I do think human nature, if we, if I want to use that term, but you know, in the sense that Mark uses it, human nature is changing. It's not this obviously what the Angcaps think is of greed or whatever. I think it's international fraternity, and I think we retain this as a species as we move through history. But you know, we still have to convince everyone of what is in their interest or what we want or whatever. Well, it's the just expansion you know. of the concept of, <laughs> you know, right. You know, that's yeah. the expansion of the concept of family, expansion of the concept of community. It's, you know, you don't get, like, the fact that, you know, west, the west of the U.S. and the east of the U.S. are so different, and yet at the same time, they all say, we're all Americans, and they, you know, they see each other, you know, despite being... <laughs> You know, being closer, you know, someone who lives on, like, the south border of, like, California, right next to Mexico, has more in common with someone, like, you know, what is it, like, a thousand miles away on the east coast. And they live right there, like, five miles away from Mexico. Yeah. You know, it's like a world apart. And it's yeah. all based on, and they see each other, you know, as a world apart. You know, those are the Mexicans, and these are the Americans. And the whole problem is the expansion of the sense of the human community. Mm -hmm. America's weird, though. It's not really one cultural identity or whatever, though. Yeah, we're all Americans, but people on the West Coast are different in certain ways than people on the East Coast. Uh, and they have more in relation to people in Mexico in some ways, probably, than people in Maine maybe <laughs> people on the east coast apparently eat way more deep dish pizza than we eat here oh yeah definitely and of course there's a difference between the north and the south yeah north south northeast black. northwest so middle america you know all the juggalos <laughs> i'm sorry but like, I don't know any Juggalos, but I always think of them as being, like, in the Midwest or something. I just see nothing in common with those people. Alright, care to read a history of the <laughs> continuing process? Yeah, let's go for it. Oh, you mean me read it? Yeah, go ahead. Aloud? Yeah, okay. History is a continuous process. In history, up to the present, it is certainly an empirical fact that separate individuals have, with the broadening of their activity into world historical activity, become more and more enslaved under a power alien to them, a pressure, a, a pressure which they have conceived of as a dirty trick on the part of the so-called universal spirit, etc., a power which has become more and more enormous, and, in the last instance, turns out to be the world market. You want me to stop after each sentence and we can talk about it? Or just read the whole thing? Okay. But it is just as empirically established that by the overthrow of the existing state of society by the communist revolution, of which more below, and the abolition of private property, which is identical with it, this power, which so baffles the German theoreticians, will be dissolved. And that then the liberation of each single individual will be accomplished in the measure in which history becomes transformed into world history. From the above, it is clear that the real intellectual wealth of the individual depends entirely on the wealth of his real connections. Only then will the separate individual be liberated from the various national and local barriers, be brought in into practical connection with the material and intellectual production of the whole world, and be put in a position to acquire the capacity to enjoy this all-sided production of the whole earth, the creations of man. All-round dependence, this natural form of the world historical co cooperation of individuals, will be transformed by this communist revolution into the control and conscious mastery of these powers, which, born of the action of men on one another, have till now overawed and governed men as powers completely alien to them. Now this view can be expressed again in speculative idealistic, that is to say, fantastic, terms as self-generation of the species, uh, quote, society as the subject, unquote, 
and thereby the consecutive series of interrelated individuals connected with each other can be conceived as a single individual which accomplishes the mastery of generating itself. It is clear here that individuals certainly make one another physically and mentally, but do not make themselves. The last part reminds me a lot of spirit. Yeah, and that, you that's know, what he's talking about. He's yeah. ragging on Hegel. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, of course, like, as Hegel says, uh, I, I, I want a community of conscious life. I want a community where people know themselves and are interacting with each other on the basis of understanding each other or whatever, but, eh, is it viable? I don't know. I mean, we do it here, so it works in this microcosm, but. Does it happen? <laughs> Can it happen globally? Uh, probably not. In uh, definitely no, not in my I lifetime. I think so. No, I think it's in my lifetime. Be, well, not in, maybe not in our lifetimes, but I mean, when he talks yeah. about the, you know history becoming world history, yeah. it's already happened. Oh, we're headed there. Yeah, it's already happened. Definitely, but we're headed I mean, in the like direction. I, uh, China, I, I, India, like oh, the entire world is is jumped yeah. is being pulled and dragged into modernity, whether it wants to or not. Yep. Everyone's connected you know, via like, the internet yeah. and so yeah, on. Yeah, everyone's connected nowadays. I mean, literally. Uh, yeah. Barring, you know, uh, much of Africa, but uh, even then, eventually it's going to get dragged in. Everything everything is... The, the system of capital has that one thing going for it, in which it naturally expands and overtakes, and it connects. And it goes beyond the national boundaries. It brings everyone into interdependence. I have faith in spirit, though. But, I don't know. You know. This is like, <laughs> like this is like the highest jump of spirit, man. Like, yeah. Oh yeah. Zizek <laughs> is like very pessimistic about spirit. He, he thinks it doesn't exist really in the way that he hopes it would. I don't know. It always seems which that I can way, see I though. Yeah. Even, yeah, even yeah I know. That's how I feel. Yeah. Like, I think it's just our contingent uh, circumstances that make us feel that way. But it, it doesn't care what we think, you know. It goes on not even taking us our, our thoughts into consideration on it. <laughs> <laughs> it does what it does, whether or not we agree that it's happening or not. Uh, any other thoughts on it? I don't know. Hold on, my battery's running out. Oh, okay. I'm curious if uh, the, he's actually going to talk about the revolution below or if it cuts off here. Because of the way it was uh, structured this time. Yeah, this is like a. This feels like a really fragmentary, just random comment. He's like, oh, by the way, you know, when, communist, when the communist revolution happens, uh, you know, uh, everything will be fine. <laughs> yeah. you know, the world will be hunky-dory. Uh, you know, all these things will be gone, right? Uh, uh, some of them feel like a, a bit of a jump. Uh, you know, it says from the above, about halfway through the, that paragraph, from the above, it is clear that the real, the real intellectual <laughs> wealth of the individual depends entirely on the wealth of his real connections. Uh, um, I don't know quite what he's talking about. I mean, right before that, he's talking about world history. Uh... Sorry, what? You were cutting out a lot. Uh... Said uh, that uh, midway through that, he's talking about, he says, from the above, it is clear that the real intellectual wealth of the individual depends entirely on the wealth of his real connections. Right before that, he's talking about, you know, history becoming world history. I don't know how that connects. Mm -hmm. And then only then will the separate individuals be liberated from the various national and local barriers, be brought into practical connection with the material and intellectual production of the whole world, and be put in a position to acquire the capacity to enjoy this all-sided production of the whole earth, the creations of man. Yeah, I think it just means in the simple sense that, you know, once we see the other is not, you know, their own separate thing that we can't appreciate or whatever, 
you know, once we don't see uh, other people. engage with people of different backgrounds or whatever we form real genuine connections and a unity of difference or whatever you know like uh i have friends that we don't always see eye to eye on everything of course but we still uh, act you know uh, civilly with one another we still have fun with one another or whatever I don't know. I guess that's what he means. I mean, the wealth of his real connections, like a real connect, a genuine connection with another person of a different background or whatever, not seeing uh, a nationalism as something like our our state is superior to every other state. Therefore, uh, I can't enjoy things made by Jews, for example, you know, like that sort of thing. I mean, that that happens, but at the same time, because you're limiting kind of yourself. Like... Yeah, yeah. And at the same time, though, I don't like. Uh, I mean, it's not it's that kind I don't of like an it. idealistic well, I don't like it, thing. But... Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Think about me and Josh Al, for example. We enjoy music of all different places or whatever. You know, we're enjoying the full creations of man. We don't dismiss any real genres. You know, I even hold out hope that maybe one day there's a, there will be a contemporary country album that I might enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't dismiss any genres, so I'm not limiting myself uh, by saying, oh, you said this is country music or something, so I'm not going to give it a fair shot. <laughs> so I try to enjoy this all-sided production of the whole earth, you know, with regards to music or movies or books. Would that be fair to say, Joshua? You think that's what he means? I... Uh... I think it might be what he's trying to say. Because he means he's talking uh, about just he says material and intellectual and production. Yeah. So not just yeah, not just movies or whatever. I guess uh, music would be intellectual production. But you only do that, you, you know, know, when everything's basically <laughs> already uh, being produced for general consumption, mm -hmm. uh, which already, in my opinion, is way too idealistic. Uh, we do have societies in which this idea of the self in relation to the whole exists. Selfishness does not disappear. It resurfaces no. in a whole different manner. And that's kind of the problem. But does it, does it uh, manifest itself to such a degree that uh, it's irreconcilable? I mean, obviously, people like uh, us no, exist uh... that we don't <laughs> know about. We're yeah, not the only that. ones uh, that are appreciative it's always, of other people. Lo it's logically always, obviously, reconcilable. The problem is, yeah. in, the real, in the real world, often it does not reconcile. It usually collapses into this weird thing. Like a, I've talked with Joshua about this before, about the weirdness of how uh, capitalism both is, in, uh, is a universal individualism and an individual universal. Mm -hmm. And you see this instantiated in say, compare the U.S. to China or Japan. The character of the capitalism is an inversion of which are we going to favor? Are we going to make all individuals work for so the universal capitalism? you're cutting out capital? a lot. What did no you say idea. after Japan and China? Uh, that uh, if you compare the U.S. to Japan and China, it's sort of an inverted uh, universal individual. You know, in which... Yeah. Uh, in, uh, in the U.S., the individual is made the universal. You know, it's what all the whole society works for, really, for the individual. But in, Jap in like Japan and China, it's the inverse. It's the individual works for the universal, but it's still yeah. the same kind of universal individual. So, if you take the whole society and say, "Well, we're just gonna like have this universal capitalist," it doesn't work. And if you have this whole like, "We're just gonna have this uh, no universal capitalist, but you know, just individual capitalist," that's the only real capital. Uh, it also doesn't work. You know, there's some sort of, there's a collapsing there that just uh, destroys something that's essentially human. Well, so, you know, here it destroys community, over there it destroys individuality. Yeah, sure. Well. So, yeah, in, but then you're like, oh, well, you know, you have a, now this uh, planned production. Well, you, these problems will arise. Especially when people are at the helm. 
you piss uh, <laughs> someone off, and, uh, you know, and if you piss someone off, and all of a sudden your your shipment of uh, 300 iPads uh, just becomes lost. It <laughs> doesn't get it doesn't get there in time. I just find uh, any notion that uh, there can be this just automatic harmony between the individual and the universal nonsense. Yeah, but I want I want conscious mastery of these powers. It just requires like subjects that are thoughtful, I guess, and it's too idealistic to consider a future in which. Uh, all people will be conscious of everything that they do or whatever. You know, consider yeah, how I've been reading their Kirchhoff. actions affect the whole. Yeah. Which one? Yeah, like, Which uh, part? The lectures. I mean, that's the only thing that's in English, really. But uh, yeah, there's like one, uh, one set of lectures he goes about this, about how, uh, you know, uh, philosophy and wisdom. And he, one of them is about, the, well, who can become wise? And, you know, it's the philosopher, but who can be the philosopher? Well, the only, it's the person who actually cares about the questions. Because yeah. there's plenty of people who have, who think they have philosophical questions, but they're not willing to go the full way. And so they can never gain wisdom. And then there are people who will define wisdom as some other way, like literally irrationally. And there's no way to convince them, you know, they're irrational already. So, you know, Kojev literally just kind of like hangs his head and says, well, you know, technically Hegel is right, but he can only convince those who are willing to see that he's mm -hmm. right. Exactly. And it's the same way yeah. about society. You can't get everybody to come, become enlightened because well, not yeah. everybody actually wants to be enlightened. Or accepts your enlightenment uh, as enlightenment. Have... And this is, of course, why you can't have... Uh, democracy and freedom at the same time. Yeah. This is why we're just a Hegelian circle jerk. Seen, uh, or rather, you know, seen that way from the outside. I mean, if I came to a group and they said they had the, all the answers and everything I said, they just said, well, this person said this. I, I might, like, be have contempt for that person but you know but i don't do that hegel did it i know i know i'm just saying like if i were you know a less uh open person like if i went to the Utan <laughs> unitarian universalists or something and i was like well what is what about this what do you think about this and then they just referred to like their literature about it or whatever and just dismissed whatever i thought Sure, I might feel a little alienated from that. Well, yeah, like but, it's, uh, it may seem like a dogmatic cult from the outside, but it's really not at all. Well, no, because I don't know. I don't know who thinks like we do that. Ego yeah. Waffles thinks we do that, but oh, tons just, of people do. He just never accepted like the very things we put to question him. You know, when we asked him to explain, he never actually explained, and he thought that his non-explanation was an explanation. And that's it. Like, that's most of the arguments between, like, people who refuse to go. It's like, well, Hegel can't possibly write. Well, according to what? Well, according to my intuitions, my presuppositions, well, and why are those? Why have those? Well, you know, they feel right. Well, good for you. Appealing to feeling. Good job. I mean, like, not, I can't argue against that, you know, literally. Yeah. It's, uh... Yeah, there's no arguing. You can't argue against an oracle that they're appealing to inside their mind. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of how Hegel refers to his common sense, but I'm not saying they're crazy. It's just, like, I can see where they're coming from if they have a feeling. Like, I have feelings all the time. Like, I feel hungry and I want a uh, strawberry sundae, but, you know, it's not logical or anything. It's just, you know, what I want at the time. <laughs> all right, the last section on alienation. Okay. You want me to read it, or...? Yeah. Alienation. Oh, five, development of the productive forces. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, five, development of the productive forces as a material premise of communism. This, quote-unquote, alienation, to use a term which will be comprehensible to the philosophers, can, of course, only be abolished given to practical premises. For it to become an, quote-unquote, intolerable power, 
that is, a power against which men make a revolution, it must necessarily have rendered the great mass of humanity, quote-unquote, propertyless, and produced, at the same time, the contradiction of an existing world of wealth and culture, both of which conditions presuppose a great increase in productive power, a high degree of its development. And, on the other hand, this development of productive forces, which itself implies the actual empirical existence of men in their world historical instead of local being, is an absolutely nece uh, necessary uh, practical premise, because without it, want is merely made general, and with destitution, the struggle for necessities and all the old filthy business would necessarily be reproduced. And furthermore, because only with this universal development of productive forces is a universal intercourse between men established, which produces in all nations simultaneously the phenomenon of the quote-unquote propertyless, uh, propertyless mass, uh, universal competition, makes each nation dependent on the revolutions of the others, and finally, put, uh, finally has put world historical, empirically, uh, universal individuals in place of local ones. Without this, one, communism could only exist as a local event, two, the forces of intercourse themselves could not have developed as universal, hence intolerable powers, they would have remained homebred uh, conditions surrounded by superstition, and three, each extension of intercourse would abolish local communism. Empirically, communism is only possible as the act of the dominant peoples, quote-unquote, all at once and simultaneously which presupposes the universal development of productive forces and the world intercourse bound up with communism. Moreover, the mass of propertyless workers, the utterly precarious position of labor, power on a mass scale cut off from capital or from even a limited satisfaction, and therefore no longer merely temporally uh, derived of work, uh, sorry, deprived of work itself as a secure source of life, presupposes the world market through competition. The proletariat can thus only exist world historically, just as communism, its activity, can only have a quote-unquote world historical existence. World historical existence of individuals means existence of individuals which is during, directly linked up with the world history. Should I go ahead and read my favorite quote? Yep. Oh boy. <laughs> communism is for us not a state of affairs which is to be established, an ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself, we call communism the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. The conditions of this movement result from the premises now in existence. Sounds good to me. Same. All right, let's go back. Oh, yeah, <laughs> oh, she was definitely spot on with that. Communism doesn't just mean you know, as your average left com would like to tell you, <laughs> the abolition of wage labor and, you know, whatever bullshit left com say, like, they like to think there's some list of guidelines that it must follow. And yeah. if it doesn't follow them, it isn't communism. But that's bullshit. Yeah. Okay, uh, AW. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, I'm just making sure your mic still worked, because I thought you would have some stuff to say, and I wanted you to get things out of the way before I just go autistic. Um, well, let I me... Mean, I, I wonder if he put property lists in that he kind of realized that they do have a property with labor power, but, uh, I mean, it's a yeah. non, non-sequitur point, I mean, it's not really important. Uh, the whole thing about world revolution, uh, yeah, I mean, it makes it makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, he talks about Otherwise, if it only happens with outliers. Yeah, yeah, he says if you know if you only have one it's one certain place, well, you know, the relations with the outside world are just going to undermine communism within. Empirically, has happened many, many times. It also implies a kind of peaceful coexistence with capitalism or with capitalist states, rather. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the only thing I don't agree with is his view of the proletariat as a universal force. I think historically we've seen that ultimately this has been false. 
that uh, the proletariat can and has and does get played against itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, All the time. Both within the I nation as say. well as across nations. I mean, look at it, man. We have no solidarity whatsoever with p yeah. workers in other countries. We don't have solidarity in the United States with workers in Mexico. We don't have solidarity with workers in China. We say, oh, we have solidarity. We don't do shit. Like, we... Well, even so, it's not like the third world has solidarity with us either. I mean, yeah. that kind of yeah. debunks the third worldist position. <laughs> so, you know, this uh, idea that, uh, you know, there were world historical, the, the proletariat is world historical and exist, can thus only exist world historically. Yeah? I think historically it's just been proven false as well as logically yeah, it has that... internal contradictions. Yeah, I think the type of proletariat he would be talking about here is one that, you know, is a Hegelian subject that knows itself as itself and recognizes what it needs or whatever for itself, which is, you know, the proletariat as proletariat as a whole, not just uh, workers in one country or whatever, because, you know, obviously we're workers of the world unite type thing. I guess that's part of why you know, the American proletariat uh, mm. cannot be a revolutionary subject because they don't know themselves as proletariat. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, I have a thing to say that's like tangentially related, I guess. Uh, but it, uh, you know, I, I'll try to bring it back. Uh, there's. A German economist and sociologist named Wolfgang Streich, uh, Zizek pointed him out in his, one of his newest books, the last, latest one I read, I forget which one it is, but, you know, he has this simple thesis that, you know, uh, he says, like, with our traditional Marxist uh, standpoint, the analyses of failures, you know, we have the best theory for why we failed. And we Hegelians are guilty of this as well. Uh, we always presuppose that whatever comes after capitalism will be this highly organized and uh, optimized structure where, you know, everything operates on a much better little level. But, you know, what, what we're seeing today is, uh, like capitalism disintegrating into lower productivity going against itself, you know, especially in the first world where capitalism is on the decline rather than on the rise. So from this, uh, decline, like how how can we see uh, a universalist structure emerging out of that? You know, like things are aren't falling apart because something new is emerging, but rather capitalism disintegrating without the prospect for anything new at all, and certainly not better to take its place. You know, it's not just one possible. Uh, One, one like possible thing among things that could have come out of feudalism like it logically came out of feudalism but what comes logically out of out of capitalism not necessarily communism we like to think that it will uh like zizek said uh i mean he uses socialism to describe social democracy when he says uh social uh, capitalism is is bankrupt and socialism is broken uh, or capitalism's broken, socialism's bankrupt, or whatever. Whatever he says, uh, what, what? And the uh, the interviewer asks him, like, what? What? What is our alternative then? And he just says communism. He doesn't explain what that means. Obviously, I mean, we like to think of many types of super capitalism, communism being one that could emerge. But I don't know. Uh, it could very well go the opposite direction where we have some sort of neo-feudalist state like uh, China suspected I think a few years ago there was a study that uh, they thought like uh, the future would be some sort of neo-feudalist type system and I'm afraid of that. Uh, what do you guys think? I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. I mean it's all just a problem of uh when are we going to unleash capitalism and when are we not? And part of the problem that capital, the reason capitalism is mostly unleashed is we're ignorant of it. Uh, 
not the people who run mm-hmm. the show uh, so much yes. as uh, us who who buy into it. who buy into it. Uh, the general mass is uh, people don't understand how it works. Therefore, they go, well, you know, the Federal Reserve must know what they're doing. You know, the government mm-hmm. must know what they're doing. You know, the economists must know what they're doing. The economists know what they're doing. You know, they're fucking us. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, you ask the average person, they don't trust the government, but they trust it in so they far trust, as yeah, they don't want to go against it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah they, they also trust, trust business. But they, even, even the average person will say, I don't like big business or whatever. They, like, they prefer small businesses. But they still, you know, use big businesses rather than small ones usually. Or even small businesses are very dependent on big businesses, in mm-hmm. a to a certain extent, anyway. I mean, yeah, I mean they're they're such a small part of the economy; they're nothing. Yeah, I think also, of course, like after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there's sort of been this idea that capitalism has won out. And it's easier for us to imagine the world ending than capitalism <laughs> ending. Definitely. Uh, I mean, but... it's stupid. Like, it really is stupid because part of it is simply because there is no state. You know, people are like, oh, well, state is there to manage capitalism. No, no. The U.S. is literally damning itself right now because the capitalists are in control. Like, the capitalists don't care about the U.S. You know, if the U.S. cared, like, we'd have tariffs and we'd just bring back a lot of things that are not here. Not that there is much to bring mm-hmm. back. A lot of it is gone because of natural technology. But, you know, I mean, Detroit, uh, you know, deindustrialization, de deconomization, like the, that happens. That's actually a part of capitalism in that, you know, capital flows, you know, capital flows out, capital flows in. Uh, and when it flows out, you're fucked because the chance of it flowing in back in is pretty low unless some really, really rich guy says makes it the popular spot. Yeah. It's like San Francisco and all these major cities. I mean, it's like a. Uh, they become major flows of capital. Why? Because that's where the rich people go. Why are they there? Because like some rich people guy got there first, and people are like, oh, I'm gonna put myself right next there. Thing. Yeah, you know, yeah. capital flows for capital flows, and capital flows wherever it goes, merely because it chooses to. There's like a your state, Atlanta. That city mm-hmm. supposedly has a major capital flows right there, and like gentrification is oh, happening yeah. massively. Definitely. I mean, I lived, um, I used to live right outside of Baltimore, and uh, Baltimore has a whole history of white flight and gentrification, and it just kind of goes in a pendulum, you know, it's like there's white flight, and all the white people go, and then there's gentrification, all the middle class white people move back in, so you kind of see it like there. I mean, I haven't been back to that city in five years, but still, like, I don't know what it's like now, but I doubt it's changed very much, except... Uh, I guess Johns Hopkins Hospital area has been uh, gentrified a bit more. Yeah. So, you know, Marx is definitely wrong in his assumptions. He realizes this later on, I think, uh, that, uh, you know, there was everywhere that capitalism goes, you know, the most forces of production would just get per- upgraded and upgraded, upgraded. What happens is really, a, you know, a, what nowadays is called a dependency theories, in which, you know, you have the peripheries and you have the centers. And the peripheries are purposely never, like, developed, ever. Because there's no need to, you know. The whole reason is they're there to be exploited. Uh, you know, they're to be... Uh, uh, the resources taken for cheap, brought into the cores, and that's it. You know, they never get redeveloped. You know, East Germany was, uh, when the wall came down, was deindustrialized. You know, it's, you know, the whole infrastructure taken down and taken elsewhere. Uh, all because, well, you know, the money flows. And, and the money flows are not stopped by anybody. Uh, they could be stopped, but nobody wants to stop them well because, you know, people in government and uh, uh, benefit off it, you know, they get a nice paycheck, and the rest of us are ignorant of how that works, so we don't know how to stop it either. We don't know who to vote for. We don't know how to, what policies are actually going to work and what are going to just screw us up. I mean, nobody knows nowadays that it's kind of the the doom of us all like nobody knows and therefore mm-hmm. we can't really d- rely on democracy for people to find out you know people just swing like a pendulum you know so if the last time the republicans failed this time we're going to vote democrat if the next yeah the last time the democrats failed this time we vote republican did they learn why they failed no they never do they just go no. well, something new 
you need the other yeah, option the this is, time. like of course the and state is powerless the state could totally destroy capital if it wanted to but it doesn't yeah i mean it's like they're trying to sell us uh, <laughs> reaganomics again and yeah. there's plenty of people who buy into it mm -hmm. cuz it makes sense when you don't think about it very much oh well they're going to trickle down. Well, black, uh, <laughs> black people. <laughs> uh, rich people don't spend their money, uh, usually. Not enough, uh, at least. They might buy another whenever golden I toilet. Hear, but... Whenever I hear trickle down economics, I think it's just some weird sort of like golden shower fetish or something. Yeah. You know, like yeah. a man in a business suit is pissing all over you. <laughs> I agree with you. They, try, they call it uh, the uh, the Trump, probably. Oh, God. Yeah, I agree with you. I can slaughter dyke that a crisis is coming. I don't know what, but, you know, we have to make a new sequitur. A uh, new logical step in the sequence, but I don't know. Uh, is <laughs> I don't it going to be like a catastrophic be... crisis, or is it just going to be the slow summer I mean, of the crisis of the We have... Well, we have these ecological crises, we have political crises, refugees. Oh, I'm way more worried about the uh, the ecological crisis than I am about the economic crisis. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Zizek I mean, thinks. Sorry, go on. Well, just because you have to question, like, what what are we actually doing to the earth? I mean, how much of this like mm -hmm. environmental destruction can be reversed at this point? I mean, that's yeah. something that always freaks me out, me out when I think about it. Yep, and uh, it it like the need for communism is greater now than ever because of ecological crises. Uh, but, well, you know, I'm kind of interested. Still don't see in, it that way. I'm interested in China's new green policies they're trying to implement. Mm -hmm. I I hope they'll be able to fight it. Actually, dude, they're they're actually blazing through that. They're ahead of schedule. Like, China actually does shit. Like, the, the state actually manages stuff. Not like the U.S. Oh, yeah, because they actually have an effective Politburo. Yeah, a bunch of uh, millionaires and billionaires, but uh, at least they seem to care about their own survival based on, like, the rest of the existing country. In the U.S., literally, we're just... Uh, our, our billionaires and millionaires are just morons. Yeah. Here I'm like a Reaganite <laughs> with that quote he said about an alien threat. Like if he said we need a universal alien threat or outside threat or whatever to make us recognize our common bond as humans and, you know, our differences would disappear worldwide if we were facing some sort of threat. But instead of aliens, uh, it's probably going to be just ecological to catastrophe. Well, no, I thought it was going to be the other way around with the aliens. <laughs> the proletariat gonna would us. unite with the aliens, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, we'd unite know, against Posadi the bourgeoisie. Posadism, you know. Oh, yeah. We have to But anyways, we... <laughs> anyways, we've been going for two hours and 40 minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was chapter one of the German ideology. I suppose I learned some things at least about the text not that i really learned anything new about marx or from marx really yeah but uh either way we read think. it it was helpful yeah uh, for anybody who listens and uh, i've noticed that it's fewer and fewer people um, <laughs> i hope you enjoy it because we record these whether you listen to them or not anyways haha <laughs> See ya. Bye. Good night.